But to give you, before I get into this talk, just to give you a little bit of perspective. Now, this is based off of the, uh, the uh, economic service uh, data from, oh, probably about 2008 to about 2013. If we look and we just say we, for every U that we have, so this is a hypothetical, for every U that we have, we wanna have one uh, marketable product at the end of the year. Now that marketable product could be a combination of, of wool. If you're a wool producer, it's, it's a pound of, of, of lamb weaned combined with the amount of wool that you sell. So, so the whole goal is, is for every U I have, I wanna have one arbitrary unit sold at the end of the year. Now, when I use that that's a national average, that's the goal we're shooting for. If I take, and I took, a, took the data from uh, Southeast to Southern part of the United States and added that up and say, okay, compared to a marketable arbitrary unit of one, how much marketable product do we see coming out of the South? Now this is based on all the ag statistics data that's online and it's about 0.8. So uh, one U out of that region will produce about 0.8 arbitrary unit of marketable product. When you look at the upper mountain west, one U will produce an arbitrary unit of 1.3. And the upper mountain west does overall and has in some of these states that, uh, that, that uh, Witt brought up and wool is in that calculation that the, uh, the sheep in these areas are, uh, in, in, in these areas are, are, are uh, truly productive. And, but that gets into a lot of, yes, it's genetics. Yes, it's breed type, but it gets into what I'm gonna hit on today. And that's the environment. So we're going to just take, as we fly through this, we're just gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna enter, many of you know this, especially many of the people in the room right now are from the West. So they're familiar with some of these deals, but showing you what the true environment is for a range producer in the Great Basin area, the upper mountain West, the inner mountain West. And, um, um, and a lot of this is just like, well, what does this have to do as far as introducing Katahdin into the West or into these large production systems? Because it's a lot of FYI information, but what I want you to ask yourself is, is you have your Katahdin ewes and you're like, wow, this is what's gonna be asked of my Katahdin ewe if it was to go into that environment and can it do that? Think about the marketing venues, think about the target components that Whit brought up as we're going through the the talk and hopefully the combination of Whit and I in these talks will set it up as far as we get into the afternoon when the when the real brains, the geneticists get up and start telling how to piece these packages together or how to evaluate what you add and how it can be of a utility into these particular systems. So the good, the bad, the ugly of managing sheep on extensive rangelands. The cheesy titles are all my fault. So those on the web and those in this room, if you're like, where did they come up with these titles? Well, that was me. We were talking about coming out West. So, you know, Clint Eastwood's one of my favorite all time Western actors. So I at least had, had to grab a, a, you know, a movie title from his. But, uh, but one thing I want you to think about in this title, we do have of all our sheep operations, we have good, we have what we really like, we have what we've tried for and we have bad. But think of bad as something that's always correctable. You may have a higher abortion rate one year. Well, you can get in there and address that and then turn that bad into good next year where you don't see that. Or it may be something in terms of growth rates or whatever genetically and you buy the right seed stock to get from what you consider bad to good. The ugly, and we're gonna get that up at the end. The ugly are those things that sheep industry producers out West have to face that are almost unmovable obstacles, but we'll, we'll tackle that at the very end. So we'll talk a little bit about operational infrastructure and flow of a typical, and when I say the Western US West sheep operations, we do have a lot of small farm producers. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about these thousand, 2000, up to 17,000 youth flocks out on open extensive rangelands. Um, so we'll look at the production environment, look a little bit about predator management. That's some interesting stuff. And uh, the public lands portfolio and how that's different than much of the sheep production the lands are utilized for grazing resources uh, in the United States. So this is a typical picture of uh, what we might see in the upper mountain west of a spring grazing situation. Most of the upper mountain west is dominated by sagebrush steppe. And most of these resources that these producers are using are native rangelands, okay? Very little, uh, very little modification of the uh, vegetation there um, just because we're talking about such a large expanse of land. 
So when we look at the operational infrastructure and flow, what I want to do is talk about the two types of systems that we do have on these large operations in the West. Now I have a picture, and if you look over there on the right, <laughs> that's that's an example to give you how snow the deep the, how deep the snow can get in some of these regions. That on the far right of the slide there um, is um, is a road close sign, and that sign is ten feet tall. So you can see that snowpack is six feet. So there is actually, you can actually see the utility poles in the background, there is actually a road there, but this shot was taken at an area that sheep do graze uh, in early summer and, and early fall. Um, and so why I show that picture is it, 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 it paints a picture of, wow, you've got two different types of sheep management systems. You have complete range systems. And then what we have is what we call shed lambing system. So our infrastructure is generally a function of the type of lambing system. So you can see that if I don't have access to range 100% of the year, then most likely I do have infrastructure developed to hold animals in a feedlot or, or a confined pasture basis uh, for two, three, four months out of the year. And so we do see this. And so that's where harvested feeds are gonna be fed. And also anytime I start saying infrastructure, anytime I start saying harvested feeds, you can see that generally in shed lambing systems, they're higher input systems. There's a lot of cost, and you'll see in the tour tomorrow the level of infrastructure and cost that goes in there. But because of the high input, shed landing systems are very focused on high output. We got to have a high drop rate. We got to have a high weaning rate. Okay. Now realize that it's 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 a lot of times location. Like I said, where these are at, you're like, well, why don't you just stay on range? Well, that's why I put the picture of the snow on the right. They just may not have access to those winter range resources like what we see in southwestern Wyoming or northern Utah to where we see 100% range operations. It's, it's, it's literally nomadic. I mean, they are on the range 100% of the year and their operation in terms of what's going on, lambing, shearing, it doesn't matter. The lambing operation moves to where the sheep are. The shearing plants moves to where the sheep are and the sheep are constantly on the move and they are. So this is a low input because little infrastructure, low to moderate to output. Um, realizing that, you know, when you're on range 100%, sometimes delivering those nu nutrients that uh, Witt talked about can be a little bit difficult, and therefore we'd expect the productivity to be a little bit lower and a moderate labor input. But when you look at the lambing system, like I said, that is a function of land availability and accessibility, and I already addressed the limitations on that and why you might see as you get higher in the Rockies, more shed landing management, further south in the Rockies, more totally range management situations. So real quickly, just to give you an idea of the calendar flow, uh, you know, not too much different. I mean, when you look at the landing calendar, ranging the, the landing calendar for both types of operations ranges from February to June, but that's generally aligned with green up and or early market prices, trying to hit a higher price for the weaned lands. And so when I talk about green up, really that's what it is. Um, uh, at the U.S. Sheep Experiment Station, our lambing is timed so that our lambs on average are about 30 to 35 days of age, so they're still in a feedlot environment. And when they hit about 30 to 35 days of age, the snowpack is melted up, the heat units have risen, we're starting to grow grass, and then we can get out on range, okay? Uh, bases versus like somebody that, that uh, operation that's south of us, they go ahead and lamb about a month earlier. They're willing to go ahead and expand those additional resources and feeds harvested feeds in the feedlot because they're actually targeting a uh, uh, trying to hit the markets earlier to get the higher prices. Okay, so so it goes back and forth. Um, the spring, fall, winter grazing calendar, uh, shed lambing systems, your, your grazing will range from about April to February, Feb and it's all based on snow. Snow blocks us off of the range about January, February. Snow releases us to the range about April, May. Whereas again, when you look at your range operations, they are in areas where they can be there 100% of the time. Shearing, that's going to range from January to March for people that like a really clean fleece. At the sheep station, we lamb prior, I mean, we shear prior or before lambing and to get that clean fleece, but there are those that shear after lambing. So that's gonna be April to June. So that gives you a little bit of the calendar within these production environments. Distribution landscape use. So this is where, when we talk about pasture-based systems, where the range systems are completely different. The operations may be across several states um, and cover hundreds of miles on hoof by the sheep themselves um, or, uh, or trucks. 
mass transport is always uh, uh, an ability that these producers have to, to be involved with. You may be trucking animals, pot loads of, of animals, anywhere from 20 miles, some people up to 200 miles to go to some ranges if they're at. Realize that there are still in, in, in the US West areas to where those, <laughs> those ewes are actually ranged that distance uh, to, to from uh, winter, raise, uh, winter, winter resources to spring and then on into summer. This also adds another level of complexity that seems to be increasing more and more in terms of when we look at the fragmentation of the US West based upon you know, housing or, or whatever it may be that uh, herding easements you know, are, are standard. That's something that a US West producer has to be aware of. Some counties like Clark counties, you can just, if you got to move your cattle or your sheep, you just accept the interstate, the interstate's off limits but state highways and everything else, just turn them out and go, okay? And then the cars, it's up to the cars to have to wait for that. But we do know that when we're accessing, uh, there's uh, many people that actually heard across the US Sheep Experiment Station and they have to call and get permission for that particular easement. So those are things that these people uh, have to deal with because we've lost a lot of the contiguous rangeland enterprises. If you go back a hundred years ago, sheep producers in this particular area were always on range and they would just head south until the snow wasn't pushing them out and then simply turn around and head back north as the snow started to recede. And, but a hundred years ago, this landscape wasn't fragmented like it is, is today in terms of ownerships and roads. Also something that Western enterprises had to be very attuned to and that's public lands. And we'll get a little bit more into public lands in just a minute. But there are time of use restrictions in terms of range readiness. It may be a drought year. And if you have a public allotment on, uh, that you can graze on US Forest Service, Forest Service may say, hey, we're in a drought, we need to let this develop a little bit more, or you're gonna to have to move quickly. And so a, uh, a range producer must be always, both cattle and sheep, ready to accommodate or have a contingency plan with regard to how to handle those animals if they're pushed off of allotment or not allowed to get on that allotment like they used to be. Open range. Okay, this is basically, when we say open range, it's not Kevin Costner and Robert Duvall, their movie. Um, uh, this, uh, you can tell I love Western movies. <laughs> but uh, no, open range is, is basically the fenceless environment. And, uh, and so in most US West states, we are open range state. What that means is that if you're driving down the highway and there's a cow or a sheep on that highway and you hit it, who's, Who's liable for the damage? Does the producer owe you money? Or do you owe the producer money? It's an open range state. You have been warned. You're the one that's liable for paying for that animal plus paying for your own car. Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, just to give you an example of a little bit different than what we would maybe see back east. Simply put, fences are not necessarily con constructed like in the state of Idaho, fences are not necessarily constructed to keep animals in. They're actually constructed to keep animals out. So if your, neighbors, if your neighbor's animals are coming and grazing on your property, it's your responsibility to put the barrier up versus the other deal. In some situations, it varies from county to county and city to city, but just something to keep in mind. Because we're in an open range situation, that's why herders are the core of your component. You do have to have herders and because not only do they keep the animals together, but that's how you, uh, that's how you set up and manage your rangelands. Okay, we're just not gonna let animals go and graze like it's a fenced pasture and we'll send them graze where they want to. A herder's responsibility is to take those animals to a very specific area. And because of that, um, you can already, you can already uh, realize that, and it's the same thing for water, um, going from water hole to water hole, but herdable flocks, flocks that can be managed as a cohesive unit is core for a herder and core for these systems to work on open range. So let's talk a little bit about the production environment and we'll kind of go into the winter extremes. But, but you always hear these people, you know, you hear these cowboys and even these sheep guys go, man, does your animal range? And, then, and, and you know, if, if you've never exposed to that term, it's just like, what, what does that mean? Basically, what, what we're talking about is, is that, that it's a desert. The U.S. West is a desert or semi-desert to some level. And so what we're asking of these animals out here is, is that plants are sparsely distributed, water holes are partially distributed. So a sheep, so think about this, this is what I challenge you at first. Think about how would my sheep, small, far, small flock pasture basis, perform in this environment? Sheep in the U.S. West are constantly on the move. And that's what it means to range. Can they get out? Can they seek the resources they need to not just survive, but to 
produce at a high level? Do they have the ability to make it to the next vertical? A lot of times in the US West, we don't deliver. If we have snow on the ground, the forage available, we may not necessarily be delivering water to them because sheep are expected to drive part of their moisture requirement from the snow itself. Okay, so these are some of the deals as far as looking at Katahdin's. How would Katahdin's perform in this particular environment? Can they range? Um, minerals and salt, you know, we talked a little bit about on the mineral requirements, but minerals and salt sometimes, you know, they're limiting everywhere. I mean, that's why we provide it all the way across the United States. But if you have a small flock or a small pasture, it's easy to always keep that salt, that bin full or whatever mineral there. Realize that especially a lot of times in the summer months, uh, for U.S. sheep operations that are in some very remote country, salt will get it there when we can get it there, and usually it's on a string of horses. Some of our ranges take two hours to access by horseback. There is no four-wheeler trail. There is no, and so the thing is, that sure enough, when you dump that salt out, you you you, you don't have to call to use. They're there. They they, they know what they know what they know what tanyards loaded with salt look like, and they're following the horses. And so, so that's a challenge. So that, you know, although we know that's a limitation and that's a need nutritionally, it's sometimes hard to hit it right on. In the US West, climate extremes are the norm, not the exception. Okay, we do have an average temperature in, in, in this area. And, uh, but like today, today was supposed to be a nice warm sunny day. And I didn't need to be bumping the heater up in this room, especially that we're in June, but we had to warm the building up and everything because the West is the extremes. One day is the extreme or the other. And when somebody says, oh, the average temperature is 80 degrees, it really means nothing because that means it can be between 20 and 120, okay? But that is the environment. And so just to give you an example to sum up the, uh, the production environment part, uh, the, I know there's a lot, of, a lot of noise going on on this particular slide, but what I want you to do is look over on that graph. This is out of publication that we did, and it was looking at, at the impact of very extreme winter grazing environments. And uh, so if you look at the far right, yeah, this is in Celsius, but we have minimal temperature and right temperature, the far right of that graph. So what we're talking about is about, you know, 30 degrees Fahrenheit down to, you know, down to close to zero degrees Fahrenheit in these extremes. Actually, I call this extreme, these temperatures for when we, when we collected this data, this is kind of some historical data I pulled out of the archive back in 89 and in 1990, where they were looking at new body weight loss on rangeland. That, those were actually very warm winters, okay? so. Commonly on the particular, some of these allotments, the Celsius scale and the Fahrenheit scale merge. That's negative 40, okay? That's, and that's, it's not uncommon for these areas to get like that. And this is, actually it's a very productive winter range where these areas are. The, sto the snow stays off the landscape, high quality forages and, and, and used to be a highly sought after area. So we're looking out there grazing anywhere from 20 to 60 days over these years that are in this particular data set. But here's what I want to talk about. We're talking about two months pregnant ewes, so they're you know, 60 days into gestation, and we're looking at substantial body weight loss. Just quickly, I'll show you what we're talking about. So I have on the y-axis, we have litter size at the bottom, body weight condition, I mean, just body weight condition, body weight change, BYC is body weight change, and it, it's in kilograms, so just double the number. And initial body weight up the top, broken down by breeds, Columbia, Pabate, Ramblay, Targhee, and on the bottom, x-axis were age by year. So we're looking at two year olds, three year olds, four all the way up to seven year olds. Now what I want you to focus on, polypay is an ex ex excellent animal. Columbia, Rambouillet, and Targhee are very, very similar animals. Okay, Columbia and Targhee and polypay were all developed at the U.S. Sheep Experiment Station. They were built on the base of the Rambouillet breed. Um, but the polypay, and, and, and Whit mentioned this in his former talk, actually has a smidgen of fin sheep. That's what makes it a little bit different. But what I want to show you is interesting. If you look at body weight change, so your middle row, scoot over to polypay and look at those little triangles. What we're looking at is we're looking at anywhere from about a 15, uh, about a two to a 15 pound body weight loss every winter. And this is in 60 days of pregnancy and we're losing weight. Is that something that you see on your operation? Do your cotons lose weight? Is your goal to have your Katahdins lose weight as soon as you get them pregnant? Well, it's not these, it's not the Western producer's goal for this to happen. This is a function of the environment and the resources that they, they have. But, you know, I always have to brag on the polypay on this part, but what, look what's amazing. The older the ewe gets past three years of age, she loses more and more body weight each time she goes out. 
What you see on litter size though, <laughs> is that man right there at 240% doesn't even waver all the way to seven years of age. And my point is, is this is just the environment that you're, that you're in. If we just kind of take a little sidebar and talk about, wow, well, kind of what's different on the other breeds, the straight wool breeds? Well, the polypay, you're like, well, don't they look terrible if they're losing this much body weight? No, the polypays are usually the first of the trunk and they come in looking really good. Polypays have a unique ability because of the fin in them to actually go out to range a little bit heavier, a little bit fatter. They actually have more, more to lose. The bigger sheep, the Columbias were always the last ones to lag in. You know, it's, it's, it's tough on those bigger animals out there on that range. But anyway, that's just kind of a side note. So let's talk about predators. This dog, his name is unknown, and that's because his records got confused with other dogs' record, and we can't really actually figure out which dog this is. <laughs> so he goes by Hey Dog or Unknown, and uh, very active, good old, older, older dog, and, and, uh, but it's, 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 he, he has done very, very well as, at his job as a large guardian dog, not just a guardian dog, but a large guardian dog. And so the data I'm going to use is from NOMS, it's APHIS, and we're going to look at predators, and we're going to look at who the culprit, who's responsible for killing all of our sheep and lambs as we, as we look into the year. And what I've done is I've averaged the data, so I've taken that upper mountain west, so we got Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho, and we're comparing it to what I'm calling the other and the other of all of these states where we see the bulk of these, a lot of these farm flocks. Okay, so we've got the Midwest in there, we got the South, we got New England East and some of the, the plain states uh, in those data. So green is the West, red is the other. Now let's look at the depredation on mature sheep. And this is, like I said, this is 2015, the most recent, uh, or 2014, most recent off of the NOMS APHIS report. Boy, what doesn't surprise you? Coyotes. I mean, I'm, there's nothing you can do about it. The coyotes are coyotes. You know, they're they're they uh, they are, have always and will always be uh, your major uh, culprit for taking out animals. But what's interesting here is when you look at the green bars, when you look at out west, we see that what we would expect bears on our mature animals, bears and mountain lions make up the the the, the balance of that. Whereas when you're looking at fenced, higher populated with people areas back east. We see dogs, and it doesn't even have to be feral dogs. It could be your neighbor's dog or your dog or, yeah, that feral pack of dogs running around. So if you add these numbers together, I mean, they pretty much kind of go as far as the percentage of depri uh, deprivation by predators in west versus east is actually about the same in terms of percentage of flock. It's just who's doing it. So the picture it paints and what I'm talking about here is the environment your animals are in, okay, going back, can my animal perform in that unit, but also going back to the, the value of a guardian dog and what type of guardian dog. Can you use the same guardian dog that you use to fend off just your neighbor's dog? How do they do up against mountain lions and bears? How do they do up against a wolf pack? One of the interesting things about a bear, bear numbers are always kind of funny as far as uh, uh, predator takes by bears, is that a lot of times a bear can result in the death of 150 ewes at one whack and not even be concerned about eating any of those ewes. They were just wandering through the area, minding their own business. They top the hill and this flock of sheep sees and they're just like, bear. And they turn all around. And so you got a thousand sheep running down to 30% grade and you get into the pile up incidences. This sometimes happens with wolves too. Um, but just so that's kind of, sometimes you see peaks and numbers from year to year. And like I said, that bear may have not even touched one of those, touched one of those carcasses. Now let's look at the lamb. Again, coyotes, as far as your lamb are the big ones. Um, what we see up here is we see the, the it's a barely blip down the side, but birds, you know, our ravens and our eagles, they, they obviously start, but it's about equal no matter where you're at. But I think what the most interesting part of this graph, again, back east, small pasture system, dogs are your main one besides coyotes. You get back west, bears and mountain lions. But look at mountain lions for the east. That's one thing that we're seeing nationwide. We're seeing all predators increasing in numbers. And uh, 40 years ago, that wouldn't even been a blip on the, the black back east numbers as far as uh, the mountain lion kills on lambs in, in other areas. So just, again, something to think about. But this is leading to the point about that guard dog I opened up this section of the talk with. Is that guard dog types and breeds and numbers in the West should match your predator threat. Okay, so right now we have two large guardian dogs per band of sheep. When we move up to the summer range, that number will be elevated to six per band. 
Two dogs can do pretty well against coyotes, but a pack of wolves, that takes a pack of dogs, okay? So you can see the costs that are involved. I mean, you guys, many of you invest in guardian dogs, you know how much these animals cost. But what I'm, what I'm getting down to is, is that then, then the herder also has to be able, they're managing a flock of sheep, but if you got a pack of dogs, they take management too, because if the dogs start fighting amongst each other, then you get dogs wandering off. And if you're grazing public lands, and like I said, again, we'll get into this at the end, you don't want a wandering dog on public lands. That does increase your risk of liability. I mean, like I said, we'll talk about a little bit as far as human interaction. But the bottom point is what I want you to focus on. Sheep must have experience with guardian dogs and respond in a unified manner when predators are present and guard dogs are doing their job. How many, how many, how many realize that your sheep do respond to your guardian dogs? Okay, under attack, you realize that. What about if your sheep are not under attack and everything is hunky-dory? Do your sheep still respond to guardian dogs? And some of you are shaking your head. Yes, let me show you exactly how they respond. So this graph right here, a lot of data. What, what, it, what it was is it was studied to where we took um, groups of sheep, put them in an area, had GPS collars on them, so we're collecting all that movement. Dog. We're looking at the total amount of distance they travel a day. We had one group of sheep without large guardian dogs. The other group sheep group of sheep had large guardian dogs present. And then we followed these movements. Well, lo and behold, what we found out is, is look at day one, that's meters, so convert it to yards, whatever. Um, as far as large guard, large guard dogs present or absence, it's a new area. You turn the sheep into a new area. They're a little bit timid. They're kind of sticking together. They're just kind of, they're kind of exploring, figuring it out, but there's really no difference. But just in 24 hours, look at what the difference under no, there was, oh, these, these were cool. This is what we could do at the U.S. Sheep Experiment Station. There was absolutely zero threat. We put them in areas to where there was no threat of any predator attack. We actually have an area that we can fence out coyotes. Coyotes cannot get into the area. And so there was no predator threat available. But look how the sheep really calmed in where they were, uh, when the large guard dogs weren't there on day two, you know, still about 7,000 meters a day. That's about all they would travel, okay? Just kind of still grouping up, not really spreading out, still kind of timid. But in a lot of these rock bosch, not bosch, rock bosch crosses, which those dogs on like Pyr Pyrenees don't really spend a lot of time with the sheep. They always kind of like to get up on a hill and watch things. But look how those sheep that had large guard dogs present under zero threat of predator attack get out and got out in range. They utilize that range more. So my point is, is, is again, we're going back and you're looking at your animal when you're looking at Katahdins and everything. How would Katahdins respond in this environment? We have the impact of the herder. Do they respond to a herder manipulating and moving them around? But also the other inputs that we rely on to the guard dogs. Do they respond to that guard dog's present? And do they get out and graze and range and take advantage of that protectiveness? Okay, so just something to think about. Um, so this is a, what we call tall forb community. It's uh, high up in the mountains. It's a highly contested landscape. Uh, recreationists and hikers, they like it just as much as cattle and sheep producers do. Um, but this gets into my talk topic about the public land portfolio. And so we talked about the good and the bad uh, that we see in the production environment and things that we can work on, things that we can correct, things that we can adapt our sheep to, determine can our sheep perform in that environment or not. But now we get to the uh, about production of, of, of sheep in the U.S. West. So the public lands portfolio of our government um, is a huge component of our nation's food security infrastructure. Always keep that in mind. Everybody thinks about the West and like hunting, hiking, Yellowstone Park, all those things. I mean, many of you, if you flew in or drove in, you had to battle the Yellowstone traffic. Uh, Whit missed out on his rental car um, because all of them were gone because the Yellowstone visitors, they got, they got the rental cars first. But that's what people think of the West. But people fail to realize how much good, nutritious food that's in our supermarket for us to purchase is derived off these landscapes. This is consumable resources. In times of trouble, that is, a lot of people just don't realize that the U.S. West public lands are in the food security portfolio, especially if we get into real problems in the country with shortage of food, because that's how you can get protein on your table the fastest, get them out there on that grass, slum that animal, okay? Access to public lands was and is still a primary driver of the evolution of the U.S. Uh, livestock industry, so cattle and sheep. But because of that, if you look over the last 150 years, the size of livestock operations out here in terms of their inventory numbers is evolved around how much access they had to these public lands. 
because you may see a producer that only has a very small amount of land. They may only have two or 3,000, maybe 4,000 deeded acres, but they also may have access to 70,000 public land acres. Well, obviously they're going to grow their flocks and their herds to match those resources. But think about it. If these public land permits to graze start coming under attack, if they're revoked, if they're canceled, if they're suspended, if they're modified, then all of a sudden we're looking at real issues in terms of that producer of probably having to liquidate because it's becoming more and more difficult to find alternative grazing resources. So where the ugly becomes real, um, you're like, well, what drives? I mean, what's driving the loss of these, these uh, public lands grazing opportunities? Well, National Environmental Policy Act in 1969, the Endangered Species Act of 1973, and there are all, uh, many other acts out there that bloomed up in the Nixon administration. Um, uh, has had probably the greatest impact of closure of public land grazing allotments. Not the acts themselves, it's people that are opposed to agriculture on these landscapes that has been able to utilize these through litigation. And so uh, Amy Hendrickson, the executive director of um, Wyoming Wool Growers, uh, I think accurately surmised that uh, direct quote, recent governmental policy changes and sub quote, because of litigation pressure in public land management has resulted in permanent closure of many public land grazing allotments with specific emphasis on forest service sheep grazing allotments, okay? This was something that was addressed in the original grizzly bear recovery plan uh, soon after the, the bears were listed in 1975 with sheep. That was specifically in that wording to target sheep grazing allotments to enhance the recovery of grizzly bears. Particularly damage to public land grazing and especially to sheep ranching in uh, Western US are policies that are manipulated towards achieving the ideology of restoring pristine nature. I mean, we see it all the time. People go to Yellowstone Park and they're like, well, when we leave Yellowstone Park, why can't it look like all of this? Well, I ask them to remind themselves what Yellowstone Park really looks like. And it looks like 3 million visitors a year. That's what Yellowstone Park looks like. Um, but there are some cool things there geologically. Um, but the deal is, the idea is that that can be replicated. Remember people, this is a deserty landscape, the U.S. West. It cannot hold that capacity of animals. I and mean, I challenge you to do a deep study and a deep history on population and animal numbers and see that Yellowstone Park is perhaps more manipulated, man manipulated in terms of stocking density of wild ungulates as well as its vegetation com uh, composition than the Forest Service lands that surround it. So despite these challenges to cattle and sheep producers, U.S. public lands still provide a substantial grazing resource. And that's why as a group of people, Katahdin Sheep Industry, that is looking at opportunities possibly to expand your inventory, just because we see these challenges, the Western producers, still a third of the U.S. sheep inventory is out here. It's something to tap. It's something to get into. You know, Witt gave you the challenges of, of, of or, or not the challenges, but give you, gave you a description of the marketing and some of the target weights and things like that. And the geneticists will get in and talk a little bit about that more this evening. But I'm trying to tell you as far as if you're looking to sell more rams, if you're looking to sell more ewes, this is still, I think, a resource that would be considered tapping. Um, there are new emerging opportunities for sheep producers that are arising. This is something that's always been around targeted grazing, but you know, over the past, seven or eight years, targeting grazing has actually exploded much greater. BLM and Forest Service, they have, because grazing has disappeared from some of their landscapes 10, 15 years ago, they're starting to see vegetation management issues. And therefore now they're reopening doors for very specific grazing. But that also adds another additional set of environmental infrastructure challenges that, that sheep operators wanting to tap into that opportunity uh, must, must uh, uh, realize. So, Bring it home. Um, one factor that has been mentioned throughout my talk is the necessity for sheep flocks to be cohesive and stay together as an actual flock while herded on the open range. When you have wandering sheep, when you have subgroups breaking off from the band, you're going to see increased death loss because of, you know, basically starvation or basically predation. You're going to have increased labor inputs of the herders or more herders or more dogs having to get out there and patrol these areas and find these, these deal. But also in the West, it increases your litigation issues because that is one of the, the, the main leaders or the main things championed by anti-agricultural groups is the conflict, especially in stray sheep from flocks with, with the wildlife. And so that's just, you know, uh, why a flock that can herd 
under the management of a herder in open range, no fences is, is, is critical to produce well on the Western landscape. In addition to satisfying the market niches that discuss, discussed by wit, um, you know, new sheep or breed types that are managed in a rain-based production system, they, they just have to demonstrate this, this flocking ability that we see in common wool type breeds. So with that, Linda, I'll turn it over to you. Currently, don't have any from the audience, but I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Do you have any thoughts on um, or, or information or data that might support crossbreeding certain types of sheep that maybe don't flock as well with some that do, and how quickly you can sort of influence that? Yeah. So, okay. And I didn't. I didn't put myself on mute. So you have to. Repeat. Okay. Okay. So 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 just <laughs> so I don't have to repeat it. Or I should. I do have to repeat. I, so Dr. Ellison's question was um, really, I'll, I'll just try to boil it down to any data in terms of crossbreeding to get that flocking behavior. Okay. Um, there's two, there's two deals and this is all going to be anecdotal. Um, and so with they, you guys or even the producers, you're welcome to chime in, chime in too. But we have two components of flocking behavior uh, or flocking ability. Uh, the two components are one, just the behavior of the animal was that animal taught to do so, okay? And then um, uh, two is genetic, you know, is, is some of that, uh, you know, part environment or genetic to, to manipulate that behavior. One thing anecdotally I do see is, is that we don't herd our Suffolk, we do have a surf terminal star flock, we don't herd our Suffolk's on open range because they are difficult. And they, our Suffolk's actually are a closed Suffolk flock that's been here since the eighties uh, with some introduction of genetics. But so they have been, generation after generation after generation reared in this type of environment. But again and again, the purebred suffix are just much more difficult to manage as a flock in open range. So they actually are managed in a, 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 a fenced environment. However, our cause of smut faced, so our suffix crossed with the Rambouillet, suffix crossed with the, and sometimes we do hold back some of those crosses that for certain uh, projects that may have been, it should have been a terminal cross, but we've actually kept those back into our flock as production use, um, behave very well. They behave themselves in a, a flocking environment, demonstrating the same abilities as the Targhee, as a Polypay or the, uh, the Rambouillet. Um, so like I said, that's more anecdotal. But that, that goes into, so, uh, you know, just to introduce this group and those listening, I mean, with the Katahdin work, as we're building Katahdins here at the US Sheep Experiment Station for some of these projects that uh, Dr. Nodder and Dr. Stewart brought up that we're looking into, um, uh, one of the deals is it's, it, it's unfair to ask, uh, you know, I've seen research attempts in the past where people want to see, well, will this hair type sheep breed or this other type of sheep breed, will it flock? Can it be in a Western range environment? Well, they bring in mature animals. And then after a year, after, you know, they're just like, it won't work. Well, you bring in ewes from a pasture environment have never been exposed to a herder. And then what do the people do when they get out of line? They start chasing them with horses. So every time these sheep see a horse or see a dog, all they have in their mind is run as far and as fast as we can. So they never did get the chance, okay? So we, so we have to create an environment where they're reared in this. So our project is, it's kind of laborious, but is, is with our Katahdins, we have taken the ewe lambs who were born to the purebred Katahdins and they were this spring all grafted onto Rambouillet, Targhee, Polypay ewes. And they will go out with a mother that has been reared in that environment. And then we can actually separate out, is there a genetic component or is it simply environmental exposure and training? So. And I'd add, Brett, we're doing a target grazing study with Dorper across you right now. <laughs> and they're, they're yearling ewes or long yearling ewes and they flock better than any breed I have ever done in my life. Yeah. But they were night penned every night prior to coming to the study. And so behaviorally, I think, like you said, right. there's some there's some definite acclimation that sometimes we just love to say genetic, you know, and it's like that yeah, environment right, you yeah. can definitely shape. You know, honestly, to tell you, I mean, I know you could talk to producers, but I mean, with, with the industry, those who are listening on the web and those in the room is, is that there are a number of publications from a number of different universities out there that just blatantly say hair sheep, and then they list Dorper Katahdin and they run it off, are not suited for open range flocking. Now, these publications actually come from back east. And I'm like, 
what, what opportunity did they have? <laughs> but the deal is, I'm not doubt. I mean, you know, I don't mean to pick on the, the authors of that, or uh, you know, and and, and I, mean, I think there, there's something to it. But you know, our goal here is to really, really investigate that, you know, and give them a fair shot. So, well, what about the terminal fire composite? Well, those yeah. Go Yeah. The founder mothers would be about about fifty percent Suffolk or, or sorry, they would be either Suffolk or Columbia. Yeah. So they would have started with a, a half range breed mother, and they plot in a simple <coughs> way, right? Yeah. So so for the web-based crowd, so what Dr. Nodder brought up is the new terminal sire line that uh, been, has been developed, which he had a large part in. Uh, the main part in developing that particular line is, is again, it's a uh, quarter textile, three eighths Columbia, three eighths Suffolk. And, um, um, and we've had that particular flock and, and he was just asking our experience with that as a, as a, a sheep that can flock. And yes, uh, uh, Dave, you're, you're correct. We, now we do manage that particular group because so much emphasis on the meat and we're trying to follow those closely. And so they're kind of more in the pasture environment with the suffix, but we never have a problem. If all of a sudden something changes and I make the call, hey, we have these range opportunities. I want to take, uh, you know, all of the, we call it the L line. Take the L line and put that out with the Ramblaise. Nobody flinches. They just move them because those those animals behave themselves very well. Actually, they're a little bit more. Those lambs would have grown up. They would have been half of them in Columbia mothers, half of them in Columbia mothers, all together. So the idea that those lambs sort of learn to flock both from their mothers and their flockmates. Yeah. Is not is not out of the question. I think that's something that will be interesting to observe with the cottons here. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So thank you, Dave. Other questions? Okay, so with that, uh, Dr. Ellison, if uh, you can uh, kind of put the uh, the zoom on on standby mode, everybody on Zoom will be kicking back off at 1 p.m. Correct? Somebody has an agenda, right? Yeah, 1 p.m. And so then we'll have uh, Dr. Tom Murphy up first, Dr. Frecking second, and then Dr. Uh, Nodder third. And so, Melinda, with that, can you close out the Zoom? And then also we can continue any other conversation here before we break for lunch. Yep, and for all of you online, I'm going to close it out. You can use the same link to get back in when we reconvene. And so we will see you shortly. I saw you raise your hand. Yeah, lunch is run. Okay, well, we can uh, take a 15 minute bathroom break. <laughs> no, that's cool. Uh Okay, Tom, we're ready for you to share. Okay, can you see that? Yes, and you can hear us okay? Yes. Perfect. Dave, Dave, will you bring to Tom and make sure he can hear you? Hi, Tom. Hey, Dave, how are you? Good. Seems all right. Fantastic. Okay. Hi, Tom. How are you? <laughs> so you won't answer me. No. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So are we ready to get going here? Or? Yeah, go ahead, Tom. So, uh, yeah, we appreciate you kicking our afternoon session off. And everybody, this is Dr. Tom Murphy. Uh, USB Animal Research Center. And uh, anyway, so moving from point A to point range. Tom, you go ahead and take it away. All right. Thanks, Brett. So like Brett said, my name's Tom Murphy, and I'm a sheep geneticist at the Meat Animal Research Center in Clay Center, Nebraska. Doing a little research on the Rocky Mountain Cotton Association. I did see Nebraska's included in that, although we're 
on the pretty far eastern front range of the Rockies. Maybe someday we'll be able to host the meeting. So I'm going to talk about genetic improvement of Katahdins in a general sense. Uh, this really can be applied to any breed in any production environment. But what tools we talk about today can, can help, help you get a productive Katahdin range flock. Whenever I talk about genetic improvement of sheep, I go back to this graphical representation that my major professor uh, Dave Thomas used to show. So on the vertical axis here, we have some measure of flock performance. That could be ewe lambing rate or parasite tolerance. And on the horizontal axis, we have time. So genetic improvement begins with first identifying the right breed type that meets our production goals and is suited for our production environment. And you've all chosen the Katahdin as that base breed. But you also know that if you just stop there, your flock performance from a genetic standpoint is going to be stagnant over time. You're not going to change it. In order to move our flocks forward genetically, we need to start applying some pressure and accurately identifying and selecting those individuals that are genetically superior and keeping them as replacement animals. And then our final strategy that is often overlooked in purebred circles as it's kind of a curse word, but crossbreeding, crossing two or more genetically improved breeds is still the most rapid form of genetic improvement. So in this discussion, I'm gonna mostly focus on how we can most accurately identify our genetically superior Katahdins to improve performance in our production environment. So this starts with a thorough understanding of what we refer to as the basic genetic model. This model tells us that an individual's phenotype or their performance for a trait that we can see or measure is a combination of the gene variants that they carry, which influence their performance, along with the environment that they perform in. And we refer to the heritable component of an individual's genetic makeup as their breeding value. And all other factors that might impact an animal's performance can be considered environmental effects. So for example, this ram's phenotype for weaning weight may have been 52 pounds, but not all lambs weigh 52 pounds at weaning. And part of the reason that this ram may have weighed more or less than others is in part due to his breeding value or genetic merit for weaning weight, but it's also partly due to all of the non-genetic factors that can impact weaning weight like how old he was at weaning, his dam's age and milk production, whether he was born or raised as a single or twin or triplet, all of these are non-genetic and they cloud our ability to see what the true genetic merit of this ram, uh, what for weaning weight is. So an important concept in selection is heritability. Uh, heritability gets discussed a lot. I think you've all heard this term, and it's usually described mathematically as the a population measure that's the proportion of phenotypic variation attributable to variation in breeding value. This is correct, but it doesn't really give you a lot of intuition on why heritability is so important in selection and how we can use it to our advantage. A trait's heritability is just a number ranging from zero to one. And what it really tells us is it indicates the strength of the relationship between an individual's phenotype that we can see or measure and their breeding value or genetic merit. Another equally true definition is heritability measures the degree to which the phenotype of a parent is going to resemble the phenotype of their offspring. So in this table, I've listed typical heritabilities for economically important traits in sheep production. 
We have low heritability traits like survival and number of lambs born. Our most highly heritable traits across sheep production are ones that most sheep or hair sheep producers don't care about because they're associated with fleece traits. But other economically important traits like weaning weight, ultrasound, loin depth, fecal egg count, these fall into a moderately heritable category. So what the variation in heritability across traits tells us is that not all traits are created equally. In particular, for lowly heritable traits, such as our fitness traits, this means that an individual's performance for the trait doesn't reflect their true genetic merit for the trait very well. And an individual's performance for the trait that we see or measure won't reflect their progeny's performance for the trait very well either because of the large amount of environmental effects that can influence these lowly heritable traits. Okay, so we've broadly defined an animal's breeding value as their genetic merit for a trait. But a true breeding value is defined as the sum of all of the independent effects of all of the gene variants that an animal carries, which can impact their phenotype or performance. So it's kind of theoretical, but if we imagine peering into this ram's genome and riding along his DNA, Every time we encounter a gene that impacts weaning weight, we'd know what the effect of the gene variant he had at that location was, and we'd add them all up. And in doing this, we'd notice a, a few things. First of all, gene variants can have both positive and negative effects on performance. Secondly, most economically important traits are impacted by many genes. We're talking hundreds, thousands if not more. And finally, most genes have pretty small effects on performance by themselves. In this example, we might see that each gene variant only positively or negatively impacts weaning weight by a hundredth of a pound. But when we add all of these up across the entire genome, we can see pretty large differences in breeding value or genetic merit between individuals. So this ram, in this example, had more favorable gene variants than unfavorable, and it resulted in a breeding value for weaning weight of positive four pounds, or he has the genetic merit to weigh four pounds above his breed's average at weaning. The problem is we don't actually know all of the genes that impact performance for every trait, and we don't know all of the independent effects of all of these gene variants. This means that we'll never actually know an animal's true breeding value. But like anything we don't know with absolute certainty, we can predict or estimate it. And in this case of breeding values, we refer to them as estimated breeding values or EBVs. Now we make these predictions of EBVs using the phenotypes that we record on individuals and that we record on their genetic relatives. But for all predictions, accuracy matters, right? Brett was talking about your weather this morning. Yesterday, you had a prediction of what it was going to be like today. It didn't meet that prediction. It, it was poorly accurate. So our accuracy matters in any prediction. And in the case of breeding values, how accurate we are predicting an animal's true genetic potential from their performance records depends on how many performance records we're considering in our prediction, and the heritability of the trait. So ultimately, an EBV, an animal's EBV for a trait, tells us their genetic worth as a parent. So the best estimate of breeding value would be to randomly mate two or more rams to a very large group of ewes and then evaluate where their progeny perform relative one to one another and to the rest of the breed. So again, we'll consider weaning weight, but we could do this for any trait. We take the average of each ram's progeny's performance and see that progeny from ram one on the left 
weighed about three quarters of a pound below average for the breed, whereas progeny uh, from Ram 2 on the right were about a pound and a half above breed average. Since parents transmit half of their genes to their progeny, we multiply this by two and conclude that Ram 1's EBV for weaning weight is negative one and a half pounds, and Ram 2's EBV for weaning weight is positive three pounds. How accurate these EBVs are, though, depends on how many lambs we evaluated per ram and the traits heritability. So the equation we use to calculate EBV accuracy in this example isn't really important for you to remember, but seeing how EBV accuracy changes with number of records is a pretty important concept. So if we generated 25 lambs per ram, took their average weaning weight to estimate that ram's breeding value for weaning weight, we'd have an accuracy of about 75% for that particular trait, which is pretty good. 85% accuracy with 50 lambs per ram and so on. And it would take 620 lambs evaluated per ram if we wanted our EBV to have an accuracy of 99%. Unfortunately, most of us don't have the resources to conduct such large scale progeny tests on every potential RAM prospect we have. And this is not biologically possible to assess ewes with high accuracy, right? Maybe a ewe might have 25 lambs in her life, but she's not gonna have 50. Furthermore, we prefer not to generate a bunch of poor performing lambs just to conclude a ram has a poor EBV. But fortunately, we can still calculate EBVs on animals that don't have any progeny by considering that individual's phenotype and or the phenotypes of their genetic relatives that they have up to the point of evaluation. So this might be the most important point that I wanna make. I've been involved in the National Sheep Improvement Program for several years now. And I still hear a lot of negative perceptions of it from sheep producers around the country. Ultimately, they feel that a number, or in this case, an EBV, can't tell us how an animal's progeny are expected to perform. You have to actually see the animal. And when you ask these people, how then do they select replacement animals? They usually tell you, well, they use a combination of visual appraisal and performance records. But what they don't realize is that any time we use phenotypes or performance to infer an individual's genetic merit for a trait, we are estimating that individual's breeding value. They might not realize it, but that's what they're doing. And we all do this. We might say, this is my fastest growing ewe lamb. She should be genetically superior for growth than her slower, those slower growing ewe lambs. We are using that ewe lamb's performance to infer her genetic merit. We might also say that ram lamb was born a single. He should be genetically inferior for number of lambs born than those twin ram lambs. Again, we're using the performance of this ram's dam to infer his genetic merit. It's an estimated breeding value. But when we only use an individual's performance to estimate their breeding value, and if we don't do a really good job at accounting for non-genetic influences on performance, our resulting EBVs can be very inaccurate. And we might unsy unsystematically correct for non-genetic effects, right? Kind of our gut feeling when we assess our replacement animals. We might say, well, this was my fastest growing ewe lamb, but her full sister was just middle of the road. So here we're using additional information on a genetic relative to further guide our select selection efforts. We might also say, well, this ram lamb was a single, but his mother was a ewe lamb or a yearling to correct for the non-genetic effect of gametes. When we calculate EBVs in NSIP though, we're much more systematic. First, individual phenotypes are adjusted for non-genetic effects, such as sex, birth type and rear type, 
their contemporary group or uh, a group of individuals that were reared together closely in time or space. And what this does is it puts everybody on a level playing field phenotypically, remove those non-genetic effects on performance. Then when we calculate an individual's EBV, we're not just considering their own performance for a trait. We still consider it, but we consider the performance of all of their genetic relatives because they share genes in common with their genetic relatives. In calculating an individual's NSIP EBV, records from their genetic relatives are essentially weighted by how closely related they are. So records from a close genetic relative, like an individual's full sibling or parents, have more of an influence than records from more distant genetic relatives, like uncles and co cousins. But they all go into the estimated breeding value. NSIP EBVs actually go a step further than this because it's an across flock national genetic evaluation program because individual flocks that are enrolled in NSIP have shared genetics with one another. They've established pedigree linkages that enable us to account for different management or production environments unique to each, envi uh, to each operation. So EBVs can now reliably be compared across flocks that might be very different from one another. So here's a map of the current NSIP Katahdin flocks including your three USDA ARS research stations, you can see that we've definitely got some growing to do in the Intermountain West. I think part of the reason why some producers are hesitant to trust NSIP EBVs fully is because to them, it seems like a black box. Phenotypes or performance goes in and EBVs come out and they're not able to see the inner workings. But the recipe behind EBVs isn't a secret. It's just a little complex and consists of a lot of mathematical and statistical jargon. But we all use complex technologies in agriculture every single day, right? Who can fix a tractor that was built this year anymore? EBVs are no different. Their methodologies were developed and continue to be developed by scientists at many of your land-grant universities and ARS locations. And they've been thoroughly vetted and proven for several decades. So at the end of the day, NSIP EBVs provide us a much more accurate assessment of an individual's genet genetic merit than we can get from just visual appraisal or considering that individual's performance by itself. So to demonstrate this, on the left, we've got what we'll refer to as the traditional way of evaluating a ram. Uh, we're considering his genetic merit for number of lambs born, weaning weight and fecal egg count, and we're just using his own performance, or, or in the case of number of lambs born, his dam's performance. So we see that he was born a twin, and we imagine he should be carrying genes that increase lambing rate. But this wasn't his phenotype, this was his dam's phenotype. And again, lambing rate is a lowly heritable trait, which combines to give us a very low accuracy of just 16% for his genetic merit for lambing rate. For more moderately heritable traits like weaning weight or fecal egg count, we see that just considering this ram lamb's performance for those traits, serve as a somewhat decent indicator of his genetic merit with accuracies of 45 and 55%. But no matter how good we are at evaluating animals visually or with few performance records, if we only consider this single source of information, we'll never get higher accuracies than this. So on the right, we're depicting the information that might go into an NSIP EBV. We've got the same ram lamb, he's got the same performance, but we're not just going to consider his performance, we're going to include the performance of all of his genetic relatives available to us. This could be full siblings, half siblings, sire dam, great grandparents, all of them. 
So when we do this, we vastly improve our accuracies for all traits, particularly for lowly heritable traits. Here we've got real accuracies from real NSIP Katad and Ram lambs born in 2020. And none of them, when I got these accuracies, had progeny records yet. Okay, so they're unproven Ram lambs. For number of lambs born, we've got accuracies ranging 36 to 50 percent, which is much higher than when we just considered that ram lamb's birth type and had an EBV accuracy of 16 percent. We still do see improved accuracies for our more highly heritable traits too. We've got unproven ram lambs in NSIP with EBV accuracies of nearly 75 percent for fecal egg count because of the extensive pedigrees that exist in NSIP, as well as the extensive amount of performance record recording that's taken place in this breed over the years. But we still have some NSIP non-believers out there. And I've started compiling a list of some of the common sayings I hear when I encounter some of these people. A common one is, NSIP EBVs just aren't accurate enough. And again, what we've shown is it doesn't matter how good you are at evaluating an animal. Okay, this is coming from a collegiate livestock judge. NSIP EBVs will always be a more accurate assessment of an animal's true genetic merit for economically relevant traits than just considering a single performance record. Another one I hear is people may think that because they have higher performing sheep than some NSIP producers, there's no point in joining the program. And NSIP is not a breed. It's an organization that enables us to more accurately identify genetically superior individuals within a breed, no matter how high performing they are. For breeders outside of NSIP, there's no saying how much of your improved performance is due to your environment or management system. But there are individual sheep out there not enrolled in NSIP that are genetically superior to NSIP sheep. And we've shown this with progeny testing many times before, but it takes progeny testing to find those individuals. We just can't accurately identify them beforehand by just looking at them. Another misconception out there is that we're pushing everyone to join NSIP. NSIP is a program for seed stock producers. Commercial producers are the foundation of our industry, but we don't need them enrolled in NSIP. That does not include, exclude them from benefiting from NSIP though. Buying breeding rams or replacement ewes, if, if you're not generating your own, from seed stock producers with the aid of NSIP EBVs should really be the standard operating procedure in the US sheep industry going forward. We have some producers that were once enrolled in NSIP, but have since quit because they didn't see the results they wanted to see. Genetic improvement is not a get rich quick scheme. It's a long game. Our time scale is in sheep generations, not days or months or even a couple of years. So most of these producers either didn't buy in fully to the program or they just quit too early. I've heard people say, look what EBVs or in the case of beef cattle, EPDs have done to beef, the beef cattle industry. Why would we make the same mistake in sheep? And I don't fully understand this one. Using EPDs in cattle have vastly improved production efficiencies. We now produce more beef with fewer cows with these larger carcasses, mature cow weight is larger than it was 30 or 40 years ago. But EPDs themselves did not do this. We can use EBVs in our flocks and take them whatever direction you want to. If you want to de decrease mature weight or decrease your lambing rate for whatever reason, you can do that and you can do it mo most efficiently with EBV. It's the seed stock producer's decision on which direction they want to go. EBVs are the tool to get you there. And then finally, I hear people say, well, 
all this talk about genomics in Australia and the beef cattle industry, we should be focusing on that. And in reality, if you're a Katahdin producer, you've probably already heard this, but genomic enhanced EBVs will be available for NSIP Katahdin breeders in the very near future, and hopefully for other breeds later. Including genomic information into our EBV calculation is expected to further improve our accuracy and particularly for lowly heritable traits and animals lacking extensive pedigree connection. But at the end of the day, we'll still just get a number that will indicate the genetic merit of an individual and no technology will completely replace the need to collect and record data on individuals. So now we've discussed the benefits of EBVs, let's talk about how we can actually use them in practice. Like I said, an EBV is just a number that indicates the genetic merit of an individual for a trait relative to, in our case, the rest of Katahdin sheep enrolled in NSIP. So we've got two rams here, and we've got their EBVs for weaning weight, fecal egg count, and number of lambs weaned. And we can compare them by calculating the difference between their EBVs for each trait. So for weaning weight, 3.22 kilograms on the left, minus 1.8 kilograms on the right, we'd say Ram 1 is expected to carry a set of genes that make him 1.4 kilograms heavier at weaning than Ram 2. For fecal egg count and number of lambs weaned, we take the difference between these two Rams EBVs and we say, we also expect Ram 1 to carry a set of genes that give him 87% lower fecal egg count and 10% greater lamb crop at weaning than Ram 2. But in many cases, or in most cases, these rams have already performed for weaning weight and for fecal egg count, and they'll never perform for number of lambs weaned or a U trait. So EBVs are really best used prospectively and in regard to their progeny's performance. So we'll pretend we take these two rams and randomly mate them to a group of ewes and look at the progeny from them. Since they transmit half of their genes to their progeny, they also transmit half of their EBVs. And we again take the difference in EBVs between these two rams and divide it by two now, because they got 50% of their genes from their sire and the other from, from their dam. So doing this, we'd say we expect lambs from ram one to be 0.7 kilograms heavier at weaning and to have a 43% lower fecal egg count than lambs from ram two. And if we keep replacement ewe lambs out of these two rams, we expect ewe lambs from ram one to have a 5% greater lamb crop at weaning than ewe lambs from ram two. So comparing expected progeny performance between two rams also lets us assign a relative value to them, which is particularly useful when you're sitting at a ram sale. How much are you will, more are you willing to spend on one ram compared to another? So here's a ex simple example that we could address, uh, use to address that question. We expect, again, ram lambs from ram, or all lambs from ram one to weigh on average 0.7 kilograms heavier at weaning than lambs from ram two. And we assume we breed each ram to say 30 ewes, each ewe weans 1.6 lambs, and we use these two rams for three seeds. Okay. Over the course of their breeding life, we expect to market over 100 kilograms or 225 pounds of lamb more from ram one than ram two, which in the case of $1.80 a pound for market lambs are nowhere higher than that now would equate to over $400 for this ram's breeding life, ram one over ram two. So we can afford to spend $400 more on ram one than ram two, and anything less is a bargain. And this number is conservatively low because we aren't accounting for other traits like reduced dewormings or greater lamb crop, and we aren't accounting for grand progeny out of these rams that might carry 
and expect a 25% of, of these RAMs gains and so on. Usually we want to improve the performance for multiple traits at a time. We want to increase number of lambs we wean, increase individual lamb weight. We want to improve internal parasite tolerance, maybe improve our carcass characteristics and ensure that our U weights aren't getting too heavy. So selecting for multiple traits simultaneously is made much easier by multiple trait indexes that were developed within NSIP and elsewhere. And these indexes are comprised of individual trait EBVs that we then weight according to their relative economic importance or biological importance. So one index we use for terminal sire producers in NSIP is the Carcass Plus Index, which attempts to identify individuals superior for lean carcass growth. So it puts positive weightings on weaning weight and post weaning weight body weight. So we can increase growth. It puts a positive weighting on loin muscle depth so we can increase muscling and it puts a negative weight on back fat depth so we can maintain uh, leaner carcasses. Okay. A much more important index for katahdin specifically is the hair index, which is a bit of a misnomer because it does not give you the shedding ability of animals. It was developed to identify the weight of lamb weaned per you or animals genetic merit to improve total weight of lamb weaned. And it does this by placing large positive weight on number of lambs weaned and smaller positive weights on individual lamb weaning weight and maternal weaning weight, which is an indicator of milking ability or overall maternal ability. And it actually puts a small negative weight on number of lambs born, which might seem contradictory, but here we want use to wean all of the lambs that they give birth to. We don't want to just increase number of lambs born. We need them to wean more lambs. So a ewe that gives birth to triplets but only brings home twins is probably not going to have an index value as high as a ewe that only gave birth to twins but brought both of them home. So for me, indexes like the maternal hair index make breeding and selection decisions much simpler. So when we're breeding our ewes at US Mark, I first set a threshold value, and this threshold value might change from year to year, but I use the hair index and set a threshold and say any mature ewe we have that's below this threshold, which is generally about 30% of our mature ewes, she gets bred to a terminal ram. These ewes are still productive mothers. They're still able to rear lambs, they're just not going to raise replacement U and ram lambs for us. So now this gives us a proportion of our lamb crop that is benefiting from heterosis because we've crossed them terminally and benefiting from the greater average growth and carcass characteristics of the terminal breed that we use. And these aren't just any terminal rams we can find. We can improve the impact of our terminal crossbreeding system by identifying individual terminal rams with the aid of NSIP EBVs as well, but focusing on terminal traits, right? We wouldn't go out and find the highest number of lambs born Suffolk ram lamb out there because he's not generating replacements for us. Focus on those terminal traits. And then, so we've set this threshold when it comes to selecting replacement ewe lambs or ram lambs, we might have a different, different threshold. And any individual that's below the threshold for hair index gets marketed. We're not keeping them as replacement. No matter how much you like their mom, no matter what, we don't keep them as replacements. Now that we've set this threshold, we can go back to those that were above that general threshold for overall productivity and start to nitpick them, right? Or, 
or improve individual traits of interest, whether it's we want to focus more on milk production or more on internal parasite tolerance. So to wrap things up, estimated breeding values calculated by the National Sheep Improvement Program are the most effective, accurate method of selecting genetically superior replacement animals that's available to us in the United States. Using NSIP EBVs, again, should be the standard operating procedure for all levels of profit-driven sectors in the US sheep industry. We're not just numbers chasers in NSIP, we're profit chasers. So if you're a commercial producer, you should expect the person you buy rams from to give you EBVs to ensure this ram's gonna perform for you. As purebred seed stock producers, we always need to be focused on the needs of the commercial producer. And good quality purebreds make good quality crossbreds. EBVs are an important tool, but they're not our only tool. We can't breed our way out of poor management. So stay on top of your nutrition and vaccination and overall husbandry programs if you really want to realize the full genetic potential of your improved animals. NSIP EBVs aren't going to identify your poor structured half bagged ewes you still need to make those husbandry improvements yourself. NSIP EBVs aren't going to identify that your ram fails a breeding soundness exam. You still need to get them tested. So use EBVs as another tool in your toolbox to improve your operation. So with that, I'll take any questions. Any from our local audience? or our online audience. So, Dr. Morgan, quick question. Um, so one thing that I hear from producers a lot that are looking at SIP is those especially commercial producers, they'll ask how they're supposed to select Specific EBVs, so they're looking at my sheep, and let's say they want to improve growth. They'll ask me, you know, what growth should I target for? Uh, so, you know, obviously point them towards the higher, higher growth for the animals. Um, but I've had some producers that have wondered how do they know if that's going to make the factors for their averages? So, maybe you could just address that for some people just as far as how to maybe select if they don't have that type of data on their current rams, how they kind of get that data to the So I couldn't hear most of that question. Oh, I'll come to those yeah. Or if there's uh, anyone else that would repeat that. Oh. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, awesome. So just, I guess a quick question. So uh, sometimes I'll have commercial producers that are interested in NSIP, but don't have any data on their RAMs or their youth lot, they're just you know, commercial producers. And they're wondering like what level of traits to select for since they don't know kind of where they're currently at. What's your recommendation for those people since they don't have kind of a baseline average for their flock to know how they're making improvement and, and how to actually step forward versus if they're kind of staying consistent, should they just try a RAM and see how it compares? Should they, um, I guess, what are some recommendations for those who don't have kind of that baseline idea of where their animals currently range? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, for us, genetically, the best guess we can say is that those, those individuals from that flock are right at the breed average for every trait. That's our best guess. So if you're selling rams to that producer, as long as you get a ram above that 50th percentile for the traits that that producer is interested in improving, um, that would be a good start. Of course, you could market them that your highest genetic potential animals, but our best guess is they're right in the middle. And uh, if we give them rams or ewes above 
the middle, they should be improving. Awesome, thank you. Other questions for Dr. Murphy? <laughs> if, you, if you cross out on a different breed, because the Cotton Association allows you to do a few generations in and bring in that other genetic blood, um, how does that affect um, the heritability of, of the different traits? Are there certain breeds that are more heritable, say for weaning weight, or things like that? Does that, does that affect that at all? Um, no, in general, heritabilities, uh, they're, they're a biological estimate, so they're not, they don't really change all that much across breeds, um, or even species. I, I did, uh, a lot of dairy sheep work and my PhD and most of the heritabilities we got for milk production traits are in line with what you see in dairy cattle. So, there are some small differences maybe in heritabilities across breeds, but it's usually just due to the structure of the data set. But so in terms of, of what crossbreeding uh, a proportion of your flock will do, if you're an NSIP producer, I would recommend uh, placing those crossbred lambs in a different contemporary group. So they're compared with each other. Uh, and um, I, I think we have some recommendations on what data to exclude from them. You'd still want to have a record that they were born so that you gets credited with those lambs. Um, but uh, making sure that, that, that it's handled because we can't explicitly tell NSIP that they, they were crossbred. But no, in terms of changing heritabilities of traits that does that's not a concern with crossbreeding. Thank you. So Tom, we had one from Tess. Uh, thoughts about breeding crossbred or hybrid ewes to purebred sires. I think it's a very good idea. <clears throat> so your crossbred ewes. So so when we just breed a breed a Suffolk to a Katahdin ram, it's not a great example because Katahdins are composites, but assuming they're a purebred animal, we're just getting individual heteros, right? The, the lamb is a crossbred, but his dam is a purebred. We can get maternal heterosis and improve that use fertility and prolificacy above the average breeds that go into that cross in milk production by having a crossbred ewe. So yeah, you can extend this example by getting uh, Katahdin rams and breeding them to Dorper ewes and generating a crossbred ewe and, and getting maternal heterosis and then top crossing to a, a terminal ram and getting big gains in, in market lamb traits while maintaining uh, productive ewes with uh, heterosis advantages. Thank you. That's all the questions I have from online. How about in our audience here? Tom, uh, you mentioned in your presentation that uh, genetic tools will not supersede good management. Uh, we have that on record, but do you want to elaborate on that a little <laughs> bit more? Uh, well, Unfortunately, we work with a lot of nutritionists too, as us geneticists, and genetics is really the only thing that matters. But uh, a lot of times that works against us because, you know, when you when you when you apply a new nutrition program, you automatically and immediately see, or fairly immediately see, the potential and improvement from that management. And I think some people expect that to happen with selecting animals that are genetically superior. You know, you go to a ram sale, you get all hyped up that you just bought that really superior ram, you take him home, you still got to go breed you. So you still got to get lambs out of them. You raise those lambs up to breeding age, you breed those ewes 
to get lambs out of them for multiple years, you're not going to see that genetic improvement for a pretty long time. It's, it, it, it takes some time. So, and, and furthermore, more on your question there, with uh, you can have really high EBV animals and not provide them adequate nutrition, not have a mineral nutrition program. And they're not going to perform to the level that you expect them to perform if you don't supply them a beneficial environment. You know, we talked about the genetic side of that equation. The environmental side is equally important. Ultimately, we want to improve performance. We can improve it by improving breeding value, but we can also improve it at the same time by improving our environment. Thank you, Tom. I was being facetious and baiting you a little bit. You did a good job. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Well, Tom, we really appreciate it. As always, um, your talks are well delivered, but very informative. And as a nutritionist, I always uh, am open to learning more and more about what I should know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. Good Thank deal. You. All right, Brad, if, Brad, if you'll go ahead and get yours up. Okay, so. <coughs> so can, can you see my screen or can you hear me? Yeah, I think we're doing good. Yeah, we were having a little bit of problem on our end of making sure we get the full screen display on Comstock. But I think it looks like we got it uh, corrected on this end. So everybody, this is uh, Brad Frecking again, working side by side with Tom Murphy. And both Brad and Tom have been uh, I've worked with Tom for quite a while now since he, uh, before he arrived at the U.S. Marine Research Center while he was in Montana State, but it wasn't until we carried that cooperation forward as he arrived at the U.S. Mark that I got to uh, interact more and more with Brad. Um, Brad um, stems, I guess, under his postdoctoral program as Tom came in from uh, uh, Dr. Dave Thomas. Uh, Brad had the, the pleasure and the experience of uh, uh, of uh, Craig working with Craig Lymaster and uh, before he retired from the agency, and everybody uh, uh, like they know Dr. Thomas and Dr. Miller also knows Dr. Lymaster and, and the great work they have done uh, for the industry. So it's been a pleasure to over the past few years to get to know Brad and working and, and some of the work that we do between the U.S. Experiment Station and the U.S. Mark. Actually, not some all of that integrated work that we do. Um, Brad uh, is, is a key role in that. So. I'm really excited to have him uh, 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 as all the speakers speak with us today. And so with that, uh, Brad, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thanks, Brett. I, I really appreciate actually being given the opportunity to, to join with the group here and uh, discuss some, uh, I guess, what I really appreciated was earlier this morning, uh, both you and, uh, and Witt gave their little disclaimers about how not being a proponent of any one particular breed. And I'm gonna set myself up as probably being the easiest target in this particular category, but you can be assured that uh, as, a, as a scientist and particularly as a USDA ARS researcher that we are not uh, a particular proponent of any one breed, but we're here to try to solve national level problems and, and uh, do that to the best of our ability and create uh, clear and unbiased uh, experiments that give, give clear representations of results to our producer stakeholders to try to solve the problems that they're facing. So today I'm going to discuss uh, a, a relatively large experiment that was initiated, uh, envisioned and created by uh, Craig Limaster. Uh, who has uh, retired and since his retirement, uh, I was converted from a, a position where I was doing swine research back into doing some sheep research again in the fall of 2016. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go over some results of this, of this particular comparison experiment. And I think what's relevant to the Katahdin, there'll be a couple of things I wanted to really highlight, but what's really relevant to the Katahdin group itself is they should feel really good about this particular experiment being, you know, including the Katahdin for a couple of reasons. One, it's being considered as the, the control breed in this particular comparison as the, as the standard uh, hallmark bearer of, of, of hair sheep in the country to, to compare his, his new creation, the, the new composite to. 
as well as the the Katahdin breed itself actually contributes a, a quarter of the the, the genetic uh, uh, contribution in, in this composite population. So before I get to that, I, I just wanted to, you know, kind of lay the groundwork of, of the why. And obviously everybody who's in uh, sheep commercial production understands that in, you know, in the US, one of the major issues in, in our ability to be a sustainable production system is that uh, our current national average for lamb crop is, is probably somewhat below what we would consider most optimal to, to really uh, be a sustainable and, and profitable uh, production system. And, and Craig approached that particular national level problem with the idea that, you know, to attract economic investment in the industry, we're going to have to do two things. One, increase that level of reproduction in our national uh, commercial populations, and, and also decrease the amount of labor that it takes to, to invest in those types of uh, production systems. So those were the those are the whys and and uh, and you started out with a kind of a, a list of of traits and this this relates to uh, what traits would be considered to be the most beneficial or or desirable components of any pasture lambing system and I go back to the title slide I did kind of add the word pasture lambing relative to uh, range situations because I am not going to try to convince anybody out there that uh, the environment we have here at Clay Center Nebraska approaches anything that you guys see in, in the in the western range but uh, we'll refer to this production system as a you know as a low input pasture lambing system but the the traits that would be considered desirable in those systems we're, we're gonna in in our environment uh, Unless you can produce some really high quality wool, uh, we're gonna try to eliminate shearing. Uh, we wanna avoid docking tails, any la additional labor components. We don't wanna have to remove horns. We don't wanna have to deal with scrapey or OPP issues. So we'd like to have them be genetically resistant to those, uh, those disease states. Uh, you'd like them to be more resistant to parasites, uh, have long breeding seasons. This is one of the, one of the, the main traits, I think, that uh, is one of the stumbling blocks of our industry being long-term competitive with other countries and, and uh, sustainable in itself is, is just the limited time frame that uh, most of our lambs are born in the entire uh, calendar year, and it kind of limits our marketing opportunities. So a desirable you would also hopefully raise twins and potentially triplets unaided without any additional uh, labor support or nutritional uh, benefits. And to do that is really going to have to be an accumulation of things in, that balance both maternal mothering ability and prolificacy, as well as transmitting those effects uh, directly to their lambs in terms of behavior that, advance, that would enhance survival of of, of a greater number of lambs at weaning under this production system. And then of course, you'd like that you to live and have a long productive life in your system since you've already invested enough to, to get her into that system. So several of the, the breed comparison experiments that were done before this one highlighted the, the level of prolificacy advantages that a half Romanoff, didn't seem to matter what you made a Romanoff to, but um, those half Romanoff ewes are, are extremely prolific and, and develop a, have a lot of heterosis with other breeds. And there were several large breed comparisons that were done. And one of the best combinations to come out of those breed comparisons was a half Romanoff and half white Dorper in terms of overall productivity, both in low input and more intensive uh, production systems. Craig also included in this composite line a quarter Katahdin because obviously the Katahdin breed has some uh, uh, major benefits that uh, would be beneficial toward that list of traits that we just went over, in particular parasite tolerance and maybe even maybe even some some hoof health issues that they would excel in. So when we talk about these comparisons going forward, 
be very well aware that the Katahdin actually is not only one of the control breeds being compared to, but is actually in the composite breed itself. And this is was formally referred to as the Easy Care, and we've now, uh, for several political oriented reasons, have started to name this composite our uh, composite four maternal line of prolific hair sheep. So the experiment itself is a maternal line comparison under pasture lambing production systems. And it, it is a production system in that we are comparing both purebred as well as terminal crossbreeding systems. And we used Texel sires as the, as the terminal cross in this particular experiment. So we're gonna compare the newly developed composite. As I said, the, the standard bear hair breed in the United States, the Katahdin breed, and, and another prolific composite, the polypay. That, that's a wool breed in this case. So those are the, those are the three breeds. They're both uh, producing purebred lambs in this pasture lambing system, and they're producing crossbred lambs in this pasture lambing system. So this was my uh, uh, kind of disclaimer and what I want people in the audience to take home today for a couple of reasons is that don't worry so much about where a particular breed stacks up relative to another breed because both within and between breed variation for multiple traits is, is what is very, very important, okay? And just because the Katahdin doesn't rank first in, in a particular trait, you don't feel like there's a value in, in, in that particular uh, uh, genetic germplasm for that particular trait. And so just wanted to clarify again and, and, and say what, what we're really after in our, in our research program here is we want to make an unbiased comparison between those breeds so that we can give producers the information that they need. But we also want to highlight that even if a breed ranks lower for a trait, that there's substantial variation within breed and those, those tend to overlap quite a bit usually. And, and those, those uh, identifying those traits that overlap and what that variation is, is important also. And we'll, the second component of my talk will deal a little bit more with that within breed variation as opposed to uh, between breeds. So the experiment itself was set up. Uh, Craig initiated creating a, a Katahdin and Polypay flock around 2010 through 2012. In the first ewe lambs of this particular experiment, of all three of the breeds, the composite, the polypay, and the katahdin were born in 2013. And they're going to go through this pasture lambing situation for a total of four years. So ewe lambs born in 2013 are evaluated in 14, 15, 16, and 17. And then the next set of ewe lambs will come in. And in, and in 2015, we'll be evaluating two different age groups of ewes. And in 2016, three different age groups of ewes and so forth and so on. The data that I'm gonna, that I've analyzed and I'm going to uh, preliminarily show you today actually stops at the end of the 2017 year of evaluation. So it, it uh, for, for the pasture lambing component. So it's gonna have four years of production on the first replicate of ewe lambs, three years of production on the second replicate and two years of production on the, on the third replicate of ewes. The X's here indicate that that's uh, the second experiment I'll talk a little bit more about is how those use performed for a fifth parity, the 2013s in 2018, the 2014s in 2019, and the 2015s in 2020 under the more traditional barn lambing production system and allow us to actually go in there and collect some more intensive data uh, on those, and that's that'll be the second component of the, of the talk a little later on. We'll talk a little bit more about, but that's where these red X's are is where those U's were derived from. So in terms of the, the pasture lambing experiment, these this is, outlines what the management procedures were during this experiment. So we've mated these U's, groups of U's, either within their own pure breed that's what PB is standing for, or terminal mating systems. So half of those ewes were assigned 
in a multi-sire mating system for a 35-day breeding season to either purebred or terminal crossing matings. And, and they, they maintained, if they, were, if they were isolated or identified as being in a purebred mating season for their first year, they stayed in that purebred mating system for the entirety of the, of the four years of, of production that they were measured under pasture lambing. And vice versa, if they were identified in the first year as being mated to Texel sires, they stayed being mated to Texel sires throughout the entire experiment. We chose to lamb those ewes in, in 10 acre paddocks. And if you remember the title slide, that, that's what the pastures look like in late May during, uh, during our uh, evaluation. And we put approximately 100 ewes in each of those 10 acre paddocks. And during the lambing time, we tried to do as little of an intervention as possible during the lambing period. We were not going in and identifying which lambs were associated with which ewes were not tagging, doing anything of that nature. We chose to tag those lambs af after when basically it would be analogous to in the Western range to docking time when we'd bring them all in, tag everybody, castrate the males. But what we did differently in this scenario then is get a blood sample from which we could uh, genotype all of those lambs plus the parents so that we could determine uh, based on DNA parentage, which lambs were derived from which sets of parents and, and which lines in, the, in that case from those pastures. This just uh, describes the kind of the scale of the experiment of what I'm, what I'm going to show you in terms of the results. Ends up being a little over for the after 2017 year of performance, it's a little over 3,100 U exposures split evenly among the three breeds and split in half between the purebred and the terminal sire production systems. So just to orient you to, I'm gonna have several graphs that are gonna look a little bit similar like this. And just to orient you here at the beginning, uh, this we're gonna go over what the productivity levels of these different maternal U lines, the Katahdin, Polypay, or C4, and, and, and in the, the effect that is in the statistical model in this case is the interaction of maternal line by mating system. So whether or not that Katahdin was mated purebred or whether that Katahdin was mated to a Texel ram, those are, those are listed as separate bars here, as well as the, the pair of polypays or the pair of, of C4 U's. And then the trait of interest will be on the, on the y-axis, in this case, conception rate. And then on the bottom right, I've listed the p-value that we derive from the statistical analyses of that particular effect, in this case, the maternal line by mating system interaction was in the model for this particular trait. And you notice I put some big question marks on conception rates because in reality, because of the production system that we utilized with pasture lambing and not going in and defining uh, which lambs actually, which ewes actually lambed. And we clearly did not pick up every single dead lamb or if we had predation, we're not going to identify a lamb in that case, even by DNA. So these are gonna be a, a little bit perhaps lower than what you might envision in some uh, more intensive uh, uh, production systems. But this particular, so this is what we got from, the, from this evaluation. This would be number of views that were exposed that we, we identified a lamb by DNA as being produced by a specific U in one of these production systems. So as you can tell, the Katahdin's and the polypase very similar in conception rates and maybe a little bit lower than what the C4 U's would be. Since that interaction is not significant, we can actually look at the separation of means based on just the maternal line uh, effect in the model. So Statistically, as I said before, the Katahdin and the polypase, very similar conception rates, very acceptable levels. Again, I would reiterate, these are all three very well-performing good maternal lines under these production systems. So just because your ranking isn't first in the category doesn't mean that you aren't performing at a, at a, at a really high level. Just a, a general table for several traits here and I'll go into some more graphs on, on, on the columns here on the right, but just to give you an idea, uh, 
of the numbers involved that we identified. So I'm going to express these on a per U exposed basis because that's how many we knew how many ewes went into breeding and how many lambs came out. So these are the number of lambs born per U exposed in the different maternal lines and mating systems. And these are the number of lambs we in the second column or second column from the right is the number of lambs weaned on a per U exposed basis. And then the final column on the right is the is the total lamb weaning weight on a per U exposed basis. So the whole litter of, of, of lambs that they, you managed to bring in from the, from the pasture production system. And these are the, for all three of those traits, the, the overall maternal line by terminal sire production system difference was not significant. So we can actually start to look at those individual maternal line comparisons. So this is the same, basically the same graph for number of, as the numbers presented earlier, but in graphical form. So the yellow bars being the number of lambs born, green bars being the number of lambs weaned on a per year exposed basis for each of those uh, cells in terms of maternal line and, and production system. And we did have significant differences between the lines with the, uh, when you look at the just, Again, number of lambs born in yellow bars and number of lambs weaned per ewe exposed. So it's taking into account not only fertility, uh, ability of those used to be come pregnant, but fecundity and litter size as well, with very, very similar productivity between the katahdin and the, and the polypay ewes in that category. We did wean those lambs out of the pasture condition and, and then grow them up into a, our own feedlot situation and then measured lamb output of the system basically at a 20 week endpoint. So these green bars represent the, the, the 20 week weight differences on a per year exposed basis. So this is kind of the real biological index that uh, Craig was evaluating the system by uh, ultimately. So it takes into account you know, pregnancy rates, fertility, ability of getting those lambs weaned and survived, and as well as their ability to grow in the feedlot setting after they've been weaned. And, and again, we did have significant differences for those traits between the, the maternal lines, the katahdin and the, and the polypay. You can see those levels here relative to, the, to that uh, composite four uh, U that was uh, had a higher uh, number of lambs weaned, of course. Uh, so those were all values that were, were expressed on a individual U record basis. And if we look at just the individual lamb record basis, so that the direct effects of these breeds or maternal line and mating systems on, on growth here. So this would be all the katahdin lambs relative to poly polypay lambs in each of the production systems relative to the C4. So you can see where the katahdins and the, and the polypays actually, uh, or polypays probably have a little bit heavier uh, growth rates during the post weaning period to get to higher weights as you'd expect. And then the very similar uh, weights for the katahdin lambs relative to the, to the C4. And it, these would just show rather than the the interaction with the production system, but the, but the main effect of the maternal line. Same thing for lamb weaning weight. And here showing on lamb weaning weight, the, the difference between the, the two mating systems, the purebred mating system. And as, as several speakers have reiterated previously, uh, this is why crossbreeding is a beautiful thing, right? Uh, getting that, that bump up in productivity by using terminal sires on any of those uh, U types. So try to move on fairly quickly here, just uh, giving you an idea how many triplets were born under this uh, production system. We did have triplets being both born and weaned from all of, well, from the trip, from the Katahdins in, in the purebred production system, there was five sets of triplets born. Three of those uh, used weaned their entire set. Uh, there was a Few more triplets born in the polypay groups, and maybe, uh, but only the ones that uh, were made into Texels in that scenario uh, were bringing back all three sets of triplets. 
So it is possible for all three of these maternal lines to, to, uh, to be under those extensive low input pasture lambing systems and still be productive enough to, to wean sets of triplets and hopefully more sets of twins. Uh, just a general, that's the same slide I presented earlier, just to reiterate where the, where the main differences are in between the lines, very similar productivity in lambs weaned per year exposed for the Katahdin and the polypay ewes, and a few more lambs being born in those half Romanoff crossbred ewes. So just highlighting that, uh, reviewing that from the, the summary of that particular pasture lamb and component. So out of that, Let's, let's see if I can summarize. Basically, it, the summary from that is that it does take very specific and appropriate genetic resources to allow you to utilize increased reproduction under these low input systems, but it is possible. And you need to take advantage of both, as Tom was just discussing, utilize both maternal and individual lamb heterosis. And that's probably the most important aspect of increasing reproductive performance in a, in a commercial uh, production system. Uh, I'll discuss uh, the further evaluation in the next few slides. So uh, after those four parodies that they produced under the pasture lambing condition, we decided to bring a subset of those used that uh, finish four parodies on pasture and bring them into a, a, a barn-like setting where we can do some more intensive uh, phenotypic measures. And this is just a picture that represents what kind of barn facilities we have at, at US Mark, where so they can enter into the barn when they want to, and then they're being fed in these concrete bunkers, a total mixed ration when, when we bring it to them. So I, I chose to pick the data out of the pasture lambing system and split up those ewes into a couple of different uh, uh, treatment groups, you might say. And this is just showing a distribution of total number of lambs born after three parodies of those three different maternal types. And as you can see, there's basically two or three different bell-shaped curves in there. But I was really after was ewes that performed really well out here for total number of lambs weaned, and this is actually a graph of lambs born, but if I put a graph up here of lambs weaned, compared within that breed to those that had similar number of lambs born, but brought back more of their use, just like Tom was discussing about the, the real motive behind the maternal hair index in the Katahdin population, where we're after more weaned lambs rather than just more lambs born. The star here represents a identified that we actually did have some ewes that went through four years of parodies uh, in those pasture lambing conditions and were never attributed to having lambed a single time under that, under that production system. So kind of expensive ewes to carry in terms of overhead. So for the barn lambing production system, this is the kind of the experimental design. I'm gonna pick 10 ewes out of each of these cells a third of them are gonna come from each of the maternal lines. Half are gonna come from the previous four year purebred production system and half from the previous four year terminal sire production system. And we're gonna get a total of 120 ewes brought in to be evaluated this way. And uh, so we did this for three consecutive years because we had three replicates of ewe lambs that started the pasture pasture lambing uh, system. <clears throat> and here's what some of the data looked like that I was, that I was uh, trying to achieve in that I was trying to isolate or pick groups of views in the high or low treatment groups that had very similar total number of lambs born, but weaned more lambs. So if we just take a look at the very top column in here, that represents the cell of the Katahdin ewes that were in the purebred mating system that had a high number of lambs weaned. And it wasn't that they produced that many more lambs weaned, but it was that they, they basically had a very little difference between the number of lambs born and the number of lambs weaned. So <clears throat> as you can tell from those uh, different cells, 
excuse me, and get a little drink there. That uh, the the low groups would represent those that uh, had more lamb losses, fewer lambs weaned, and the high groups would basically approach zero losses in terms of uh, of number of lambs weaned relative to number of lambs born. So we did that for three years out of that 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 previous experiment and brought them into like the picture that that particular barn system and this is just a layout of the, the building that we utilized and it's about uh, uh, 90 some feet long in total but there's eight individual uh, pens inside the building and the green rectangles represent the locations that we use for the interior four pens where we where we laid out uh, uh, we put cameras up and we started taking pictures every 60 seconds during the during the lambing period itself so we could get some information and try to see what we could learn in terms of maternal uh, behavior traits as well as lamb individual behavior traits during early moments of parturition and for the first two hours before they would be put into a jug and that's just showing you the layout of the different cameras and this is what some of those camera images look like this is a picture of uh, 9.30 at night, we had a significant lighting inside the building so that we could actually still get pictures. We'd paint brand those U's on their side so we could figure out who they were and, and we would observe them having their lambs, how they, how they licked them, gathered them up, all those maternal behaviors that contribute to an enhanced bonding between that uh, dam and those lambs in terms of improving what we'd hope would improve weaning survival. So the, the phenotypes that we're looking at from those pictures, we kind of adapted from the, the Scottish Agriculture College group that spent a lot of time looking at uh, uh, maternal behavior traits. I'm not gonna go through all these behavior traits, but uh, that we looked at you behavior traits, that how well they, they took care of their lambs. And then we also look at lamb behavior traits themselves and how uh, much vigor those lambs had uh, trying to get up and, and contribute to their own survival. And I should, back up and say that all these used for the parity five evaluation in these buildings were all mated to a, a terminal sire. For the first year it was Dorset and the second two years it was Texel again. So there was, there's no difference in, in terms of the uh, contribution on the sire side within a year. So this is our statistical analysis of the, of just three phenotypic traits from that particular parity five evaluation. Uh, the intent was to get lambs that uh, uh, that were are used that were similar in 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 fertility. So if we look at the weaning group, this is the degree of freedom test for for the high versus low weaning group. We see that that's not significant here. It's at a p value of 0.47. So the high and low weaning groups that that we picked from the first four years for their fifth parity had similar levels of prolificacy in terms of number of lambs born. So that's averaged over all three of those uh, maternal line breeds. But when we look at number of, of, of you reared lambs weaned, we do now see a significant difference between those high and low weaning groups. And, and in fact, uh, highly significant in terms of total weaning weight of the of, of pounds of, of lamb per ewe reared lamb in, in this particular evaluation. That, that's kind of what I wanted to highlight from this. And I, I could go through several different slides, but I think I'm gonna maybe shorten it up a little bit because I think I'm going a little bit too long, but uh, the these bars represent then the, the, I just wanted to touch on a couple things about, you know, what we saw in this experiment is differences between the breeds as well as differences within the breed represented by those high and low groups. And this slide shows the differences between the breeds for number of lambs born and number of lambs weaned. And the maximum difference that we observed between breeds was a little between three and four tenths of a lamb per ewe lambing. But if we look at the difference between the effects of the weaning group, which is independent of those breed differences, or is, is in all three of those breed differences, we also see 
although not a, not a significant difference in number of lambs born, which is what we were intending, was that they had produced the same number of lambs born, but a difference in number of lambs weaned of about two tenths of a lamb more for the high weaning group as opposed to the low weaning group. And that effect is, you know, is, is just as significant as any of those breed differences is, is kind of the point I'm trying to make. Uh, I'm not gonna spend much time going through those uh, individual traits, um, but so the maximum difference, here's one I'll, I'll spend a little time on is that the, if, if we have a nursery facility we can take advantage of, uh, we can tear those up, separate those effects apart. Um, the yellow bars represent the pounds of lamb weaned in the nursery, pounds of lamb weaned on the ewe, and then the total. And that maximum difference that we observe between breeds is 10.7, but the difference between the high and low groups was just about as large, or 9.2 pounds. So that that's kind of the take home message is that we have both between and within breed variation uh, that, that we can measure in terms of uh, uh, productivity of those of those U types. So, so our our experiment did successfully identify U similar in prolificacy, but did differ in number of lambs weaned regardless of the breed. The performance of these three maternal lines was all exceptional. I think for parity five U's, they were mated to terminal sires, and the drop rates was two point two for Katahdin, two point three five for Polypay, and two point six for the composite four. But as I was indicating, the effect of the weaning survival group was nearly as big as any of those breed differences. And, and a lot of that is associated with things that Tom came in and we started to measure in, the, in this particular experiment that deal with utter confirmation and subclinical mastitis. And, and, the, and hopefully what we capture out of the, the camera data is some maternal and lamb behavior effects also. And that's the data that we have yet to to reach an analysis standpoint, we're still working on coding those several hundred thousand images that we've managed to record over the three year uh, period of time that this experiment was going on. So I think with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to address them. And I probably went a little bit over time from what we were intended, but there's a lot of data. Brad, thank you very much. and, and uh... You know, there's a number of things that I think, particularly to Katahdin producers, that why I was really excited that Brad agreed to present this is you get that contrast. I mean, this, this study that they set up and looked at, um, you see exactly where the Katahdin breed, you look at the polypay, and so just, just you know, and the, the comp uh, poor that they have there at US Mark, you have that breed that they developed there, the polypay breed that we developed here at the sheep station, um, are, was specifically focused for those particular environments. So this, this talk really gives you a nice, uh, a nice view of where the Katahdin set in, in comparison to, of course, the Ardian type pasture systems, um, but also comparing to the polypay, what might be asked of a Katahdin if they were to come perform out and kind of give you the benchmarks of exactly where the polypay is at. And although the polypay was developed for this system, the polypay actually went elsewhere after it was released from the, the U.S. Sheep Experiment Station to, to, to mainly the Midwest and, and those areas in there and then the Cali or the uh, West Coast. But still, that gives you a nice benchmark uh, to, to measure on that. And also, Brad, thank you for uh, uh, bringing up the, uh, uh, the issue in terms of survivability, because just like Tom also brought up in his talk, you can have, I mean, it's, it's no problem to get drop rates. I mean, you bring in the right genetics and you can really bring some drop rates out. That's but the if, beauty of sheep. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. Could set, you can set the reproductive rate at whatever level you want. But it's the point of what the end product is when you go to sell and wean. And I think, again, Brad, thank you for highlighting that. Tom opening that up and, and Brad, you are really applying the data to that. So um, I think Linda has some questions here off the web. Is the, uh, I'll let the audience here in person go first. Is uh, anybody... Have any questions here? Okay. So this yeah. is probably a little more in the weeds of a, of a question. Um, but obviously you talked about the, the breed variability. Um, so you could theoretically pick the worst of each breed and to develop that composite and end up maybe behind or, or not much ahead of 
where you would be for. Can, can, can we get a, a little better uh, contact with the microphone on that particular? I'm having trouble hearing that question. Yeah, is this better? Yeah, much better. Thank you. Yeah, let me try to turn this up a little bit. Um, so you talked about the breed variability uh, traits and, and how you have within breed variability. So if you're developing a composite, you could theoretically pick the worst of each trait from each breed and then that's like a composite that's not helping your time. Um, for producers who are trying to leverage the ability to crossbreed, what trait should they look for? So like, you know, what was Todd's contribution and what was the Romanov contribution and the Dorper contribution to that composite that you would say if someone was trying to kind of create that sort of composite in their own flock, what trait should they look for when selecting those animals? That's yeah, cool. yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. And it's a question that I know Dave probably had many long discussions with Craig. I had a lot of discussions with Craig. Craig had discussions with a lot of the scientists around the country. But when you are, and this is, this is, I think is a really important trait. Anybody can put together a composite. It's kind of fun to mix and match breeds, right? But they need to complement each other in terms of what you want that composite to do. And ultimately, what makes the most sense to me and what made the most sense I'm learning from Craig is that if you are trying to put together a composite, start with the traits that are the least heritable. In this case, reproduction level would be the, the least heritable trait and optimize the contribution of breeds for your composite to meet your target for those lower her heritability traits. And then when you have other target traits you're trying to change, then you're working with the traits that have a higher level of heritability and you can move a little bit easier, which is why I think it made sense to start with the, the, the half Romanoff. In the breed evaluation comparison that Craig did before created the composite was some of the data that Tom and I have recently uh, summarized and, and put together for publication recently, just this last year in, in Journal of Animal Science, compared all the different possible combinations of, of different F1 Romanoff types. And a lot of that data was used by Craig to make his decisions on which breeds were complementing the Romanoff the best. In that case, it was the the, the white dorper for, for a lot of the traits that uh, he was after in terms of productivity. But then if, if you're wanting additional breeds to contribute to, to strengthen traits, that's what he was also bringing in as the Katahdin in terms of, well, a couple reasons. One, they, they could contribute uh, for, you know, parasite tolerance, hoof health, shedding ability, but also because you guys as a Katahdin Breed Association have a very strong background that if this breed was ever going to contribute to something on a within breed selection basis, they had a connection to a breed that actually had a, a system in place that you could actually uh, connect with. So those, those are the thoughts that went into, and it was several years worth of thoughts and a lot of input from a lot of people on what to put that com into that composite. Any other questions from our audience here? Brad, I have a question. Could you bring me up there? Brad, can you hear me? Uh, not, not quite so well. I can't hear you too good. Better? Is that better? Yep. Yes, that's better. Thanks. Um, we've been having a lot of discussions as we head into genomics about how much we're going to discover that we've misattributed parents um, as we do DNA testing. and. The data that we have is more observation, right? That you tag lambs at birth that you think are next to the ewes that gave birth to them. And hopefully you watch them for the next couple of days and can kind of confirm that you was raising those lambs. But if you weren't tagging the lambs at birth and now you're just DNA testing, are you gonna have some margin of error in there where you don't know which ewes raised which lambs? Well, it, there, there are always potentially problems anytime you handle samples through a lab of misidentifying the DNA sample. Once, it, once you eliminate that being a possibility, when you get the correct DNA sample and you've got the parents genotyped, there is very, very little reason to suspect you would not 
correctly identify which parent. Now, well, what, I what I was... As who raised the lamb, right? So if you're trying to attribute, you know, milk or growth traits... Gotcha. Others, contribution. Gotcha. You know, we, we see so much maternal behavior where a lamb wanders away and another you takes it and raises it. Got, gotcha. Yeah, mixing and matching are you having if you're not tagging at birth to watch to make sure she's raising the lambs you think she raised. Gotcha. And in fact, uh, even in our barn lambing systems, when we have some of these more highly prolific U types, we've seen upwards of 18 to 20% uh, mismothering. And that was verified through DNA. So that's not, that's not even taking into account being under a pasture environment condition. So yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Now, the traits that are that are impacted by uh, making sure that you know what maternal environment that lamb was was under uh, aren't aren't going to be solved with the with the with the parentage identification in that case. Yeah, it seems like you need both. You need observed who raised whom, and then also DNA so that you can attribute foster mothers correctly as much as possible. That would be the most beneficial to the analyses, yes. All right, cool. Thanks, Brad. Okay, so Brad, you do have a couple of online questions, but for the sake of time, I might ask you to um, address those via yeah. typed version. And if any of our audience wants to come view those at some point. Um, thank you. Sounds good. Thanks. Ready? Yep. Okay, so um, now we got to, to close out the day, at least for our talks are concerned. We got Dr. Dave Nodder, and again, I've introduced him and reminded everybody the contributions he's made to the sheep industry as a whole, nationally and internationally. Um, you know, we had a couple other names mentioned today, colleagues that Dave worked with for many years, Dr. Dave Thomas and Dr. Craig Limaster, and we are very fortunate to have uh, uh, Dr. Nada be able to come here today uh, in person to visit with us. This is an honor. And like I said, not only for Katahdin producers, the value that he's had for the industry in terms of the breeding values that Tom introduced, um, but uh, again, all sheep industry, and he's had a huge impact on the program at the U.S. Sheep Experiment Station. So again, it's great to have him here. And with that, Dr. Nada, I'll turn it over to you and kick the light. Okay, thank you. Let me get this over. Okay, you good? Uh, well, it's such a real pleasure to be here at the station. I haven't been here for well over a year, and I haven't been anywhere for well over a year. But it's really nice to be back in Idaho, and especially to get an opportunity to talk about to this group of Katahdin readers. Uh, Let's start with some basics. Uh, and I'm gonna, I found some of this is gonna be repetitive, which is good. Uh, when I think talked about production goals, and I define those as production objectives, but very quickly, it's the same thing. Why are you in the sheep business? What is it you're trying to accomplish? Now, that's not something you think about every day. Because you never get anything done if you spend all your time thinking about that. But maybe about once a year when you go out to the barn during lambing and there aren't a bunch of ewes that, that you need to attend to, uh, maybe every once in a while you need to think about, what am I doing this for? Is this the way I want to make my living? Maybe. Is this something I want to do because I've got 30 acres of grass and feel like I ought to do something with it? Maybe. Is this something I think I'm doing for my kids? Don't ever ask them that question. Just do it. Is this something I think I'm doing for my kids so that they will learn about agriculture and responsibility of animals? What is this about? Nobody gets to judge you on your production objective. It's yours. Uh, you also probably need to think about what are you, your mating system. Again, that's been touched on. Do you really want to be predominantly producing cotton, sea stock animals? 
Or are the katana simply a means to an end that you have chosen for your commercial sheep enterprise? If you're a seed stock breeder, it doesn't really matter. You know what you do. Now you get to think about what your customers do and how you're going to produce animals that meet your customers' needs because you've probably already figured out if you don't meet your customers' needs, they don't come back no matter how much you think they should. So these are some things that come into the beginning of thinking about what your breeding program is going to be like. Then we come to the main topic of the presentation today, which is the breeding objective. And this is something you might think about very frequently. How do I develop the genetics I've chosen to use, the breed resources I've chosen to use to meet my production objective? If you're Katahdin seed stock breeders and you aspire to produce replacement new lands for rangeland producers, how do I develop the genetics that will make me successful in that endeavor? And it's best uh, done by focusing on factors that will control the costs and returns in your situation and your customer situation. It's an accounting exercise, and we all know how much fun accounting exercises can be, but it's an important part of any business to know what are the things you can change in your sheep that will make you money, and what are the things you want to avoid changing because they will or could change and might cost you money. And I think particularly of importance for this group at this session is how many different breeding objectives are needed to meet the goals of Katahdin sheep in different places and for different kinds of producers. Are you able to be a part of a national program of Katahdin breeders who have largely compatible breeding goals? Or are you going to need to take those breeding goals that are sort of typical of the national Chicago plot and modify them, finesse them, develop them to better address the needs of your local customers? Coming with that, do you aspire to market breeding stock nationally? Or will you be more impactful focusing your animals on a regional breeding stock market? I can't answer that question for you, nor would I attempt to, but hopefully we can help you to answer that with some of the thoughts we'll bring out today. Uh, I don't know if there's anything we can do about that top line, but it's not that important to miss. The breeding objective was a concept defined by Lenore Hazel in 1943. It's a function, as you can see here in the middle of the screen, it's a function of the breeding values of your sheep for each trait in the breeding objective. It's defined specifically as the effect of a one unit change in animal breeding value for each trait, holding the breeding value for all the other traits constant. So in terms of that equation, if I could change weaning weight by one year genetically and nothing else, would that make me money or cost me money? And if so, how much? If I could change number of lambs weaned by one year and change nothing else in the breeding objective, how much money would that hopefully make me? And those numbers, those weightings tell you the relative importance of the genetic traits that are available to you for selection. And to state the obvious, you want to put most of your selection emphasis on the numbers that are most impactful. You also want to recognize, as you mentioned earlier, that there are some traits that are not sufficiently impactful that you care. And that's a hard thing for breeders to accept. We got all these MEVs. 
How do we use them all? Well, maybe we throw about a quarter of them away because they aren't impactful for us in our production system. That's a big part of this process. Now, the development of a breeding objective can be very uh, intuitive with just a little bit of sort of simple accounting. We get one more pound of weaning weight and that's worth whatever it's worth this year, then that's the extra return from that. And I deduct a little bit of the feed required to get that extra pound. And that's something like the value. Uh, in a lot of cases in the last few years, we've used larger bioeconomic models that attempt to predict the impact of all of these traits on costs and returns, including things like U maintenance requirements, premiums for large muscle area for such a thing, discounts for overfat lambs, which there most certainly are such a thing. So we've tried to use those, but there are a number of ways to do this. The last thing I'll mention quickly, but maybe get to later, is breeding about, uh, objectives are generally pretty robust over time, but eventually they can change. And I'll give you some examples of that. And importantly, breeding objectives can be different for different production systems and production environments. Now, a term that may be more familiar to some of you was the selection index. That was also defined by Hazel in 1943. And it was a way that you could take the measurements you take on your animals, the phenotypes, and convert them to an index that is a best predictor of the breeding value. And that was a lot of work. And to make this a little bit shorter for purposes of time, in an era of EBVs, the selection index with all its consideration of heritabilities and genetic correlations and number of observations becomes moot because the EBVs that you get from NSIP can now, the bottom line there, be put directly into the breeding value equation. So the EBVs are the best estimates available of the genetic values of each individual. That's what we want to use in the breeding value estimate. And so we can use those EBVs directly to predict the breeding values for the breeding objective for each animal in the flock. So it makes the, the mathematics of the selection index move, uh, which bothers probably a lot of people who spend tons of time to understand them, but it's a real boon to you guys. The nice thing also is the genetic evaluation methods to get EBVs are now available to scientists and producers anywhere in the world. All you got to do is make the commitment to collect the data. And the software and the skills are there to turn those data into EBVs. You can do it by yourself for your own animals if you're so inclined. But it's certainly a much better thing to do it in an association setting so that these sort of breed-wide genetic comparisons that Tom mentioned earlier will be available to you. Now, as we think about developing breeding objectives, and again, breeding objectives, selection index are now synonymous. The thing I use, the number I use to select my animals to maximize profit. We'll call it the breeding objective, but that's what it is. It gets complicated because in the USA, NSIP now provides at least 20 different EBVs that Katahdin breeders can use for growth, wool, reproduction, disease resistance, ultrasonic carcass traits, the whole gamut of things. If you go to Land Plan Australia, they have over 85 different traits that they include in their genetic improvement program. A lot of those are wool traits in merino sheep, where you can bail on those. But that's still a huge amount of stuff. So what trait should you consider in your breeding objective? Everything, all 20 or 25 traits, 
or just a subset of traits that have direct effects on your profit and your return and your cost of production. Now, I think you already know my answer. It's the second one, it's the latter. You need to decide what things matter and you need to decide what things probably don't matter. For the Katahdin, we've got a great example. All the wool traits, they're off the table, aren't they? That simplifies things a lot. There are some other traits that might be off the table too. This is a list of the main categories of NSIP EPPs. Uh, on the left, mostly land production traits, birth weight, both the direct effect and the maternal effect, weaning weight, both the direct effect, the genetics of the lamb for growth, and the maternal effect, the genetics of the mother for things like milk production and mothering behavior that impact the lamb through the contribution of the mother. Post weaning weight, it has a maternal component, but it's not very important anymore. Yearling weight, we also can do hog it or you breeding weights. For those of you who have concerns about the size and the maintenance requirements of your ewes, not very many breeders take advantage of that, but it's available to you. <coughs> and ultrasonic measures of fat and muscle weight. On the more you side or fitness side, on the right there, we have a number of lambs, and bo lambs born and weaned, looking at litter size and lamb survival. We have fecal egg counts. We have scrotal circumference in male lambs. We have the fiber uh, array, which we're not going to talk about. If I were to look at what I think is the current emphasis in the Katahdin breed nationally, and from the little set of uh, Katahdin flocks that were shown on the map, Katahdin breed nationally largely means sort of the middle latitude of the eastern half of the US, doesn't it? Kind of across Missouri, up the Ohio River, and then a few blocks scattered around below them in the south and southeast. If I look at what I see the Katahdin breeders in that sort of traditional, that traditional heartland includes, they're the ones I've got in green. Direct and maternal effects on birth weight, direct and maternal effects on weaning weight, number of lambs born and weaned, and fecal egg counts. The ones in blue, uh, some things people are using and some things certain breeders think we should use more, post weaning weight. Uh, we don't place, I think most of the Cayenne breeders in the East and Southeast aren't in putting a ton of impact on post weaning weight. Uh, some think they really should. We'll get to that some more later. Scrotal circumference is a tool for predicting the reproductive performance of the daughters and the female relatives of those ram lambs. It's potentially informative. I realized as I was watching other people's slides, squirrel circumference is never in your breeding objective. Right? Because do you care anything about the squirrel circumference of a ram separate from anything else? Probably doesn't cost you a cent unless you're doing high semen utilization AI, which you're not. We use scrotal circumference only to get a better predictor of the number born and number lamb or number weaned in replacement new lambs. That's what's in your breeding objective. Scrotal circumference is just a tool to improve the accuracy of the evaluation of those animals for you reproductive traits, which is what we care about. Then we've got a set of traits in yellow, gearing weights and pocket breeding weights. Well, they might be important, but nobody's using them much. And ultrasonic loin muscle depth, some people think that's really important, and quite a few people are scanning Katahdins. A lot of them are scanning 50 pound weanling Katahdin lambs, and I don't think that tells me very much about muscle. Plus, most of the Katahdin flocks in the East are not getting paid for big loin mass. There's just not a way to do it. Most of the sheep in the world are not going to pay for big ultrasonic one That's a good question. <laughs> now, if I were to think about how I might want to change these to put a more rangeland emphasis on the Katahdin breeding objective, 
these are the changes I might want to make. I might want to get post weaning weight in green now for some of the reasons Wick said about carcass weights that are desired by the land buyers in the region. So I may need to put some focus on the ability of the cottons to continue to grow post weaning and therefore fit the desires of feedlot production and heavyweight lamb production. I started to say demand, so I think desires is a better word. Uh, ultrasonic loin muscle depth. Well, if we start measuring it in 100, 130 pound breeding rams, I might be more interested in it because you may come under criticism from live buyers in the region about muscle. You may, you may not. I think that's one of the reasons we have katans at the station grow. And fecal egg counts, unless you are producing on irrigated pasture. Is anybody producing on irrigated pasture? Okay, you may need some attention to fecal egg counts, but if you're producing on an environment like the one outside, <laughs> you may not care at all. And of course, that puts you in heavy duty tension with the southeastern U.S. cotton breeders who care about that almost more than anything. Tension's not a bad thing. It's just tension. Just decisions that have to be made. I don't think anybody's going to start doing many wing waves of yearlings and hogs. So I would be glad to have a conversation with you if you wanted to. Okay, this is an example of a breeding objective for Targhee. And it's messy, but let me just walk you through it. Before I do that, let me say that the Targhee breeding objective is probably the most comprehensively developed, theoretically proper economic analysis we've done for any US. We put a lot of work into figuring out the costs and returns. And let's see, I don't have the, I don't have the yeah, you can see the pointer, right? Yeah, okay. We did this a lot of different ways. We, we looked at possibly discounting land prices for heavy lands or not. We looked at a high feed cost sort of Midwestern scenario, a low feed cost range scenario. But we can focus right here on the top line, low feed costs, undiscounted land prices. And these are relative net returns. So if I increase the weaning weight EBV, number of these times here, weaning weight, maternal milk, yearling weight, fleece weight, reduced fiber diameter, staple length, and percent lamb crop bowl. These are the seven traits in the Targhee breeding objective. If we look at, these are all scaled by one additive standard deviation. So they're scaled to the fact that some traits are more heritable, some traits are more variable, some traits are easier to change, right? So they're scaled for that. And we find that in this scenario, increasing weaning weight or increasing percent land crop produces an increase in relative net returns of about 5%. It's the most important thing you can do. Increasing maternal milk is a little bit less efficient way to get heavier lands, but it's still worthwhile. Increasing relative returns about 2%. Increasing fleece weight, reducing fiber diameter, about a 1% increase in returns. Staple length is a wash, it's not a problem. We had quite a bit of debate about this, but the fact of the matter is in Targhee sheep, staple length is not a problem. Don't mess with it. Uh, yearling weight, this is the one everybody likes to talk about. Catan breeders were, or sorry, Targhee breeders were quite concerned about their sheep getting too big and the high maintenance cost of their use. And our analysis said that was a valid concern. So how do you keep use from getting too big? You place, <laughs> it, you place the negative weight on late growth, yearling weight, 
Well, that didn't go over great at first. We like those big lambs as yearlings. Do you like big, big ewes? No. How you want to get both of those things, huh? The other thing that you have to understand is we were trying to make really heavy weaning weights that did not go with really heavy adult U weights. Well, that's impossible. I can't do that. But by using this breeding objective, I can moderate the increases in adult U weight while we're pushing on the weaning weight. This breeding objective does not reduce yearling weight. It just keeps it from going up as fast as it would have gone. And I'll use this conversation and this analysis to make the point that your intuition about what a breeding objective should be will only take you so far till you actually do the math and do the accounting to see what really will cost you money and what really will make you money. It's awfully tempting to take all these things and make them all quote unquote better, bigger, finer. We don't necessarily always want to do that. Uh, I appreciate Tom's discussion. Of the, here's the other one I want to emphasize a little bit. You know, I said that breeding objectives can change, right? They change over time. And they also change in terms of how prolific the sheep are. When we did the breeding objective for Targhee, the average lamb drop on a whole flock basis for the Targhee NSIP flocks was about 1.7. And if I look at increasing that land drop, that gives me a pretty substantial increase in what in this case is weight of land weaned for you exposed. But when I go to two, which is about where I think a whole flock to cotton flock might be, this curve is flattening off pretty fast. And despite what uh, Brad said, who had the cotton and the poly pretty close together, if I think where I think the poly lives, there's little, if any, need to increase litter size unless you're really good at keeping triplets alive. And some of you may be really good at keeping triplets alive, but there's lots of precedent in range sheep for a 50% death loss in triplet lengths. Everybody's not as good as you might be at keeping triplets alive. The station is quite good at keeping triplets alive, but it still gets pretty close to that 50 or 60% survival rate for the triplet lambs. So the value of percent lamb crop in these targies, when they were one seven, might drop by a third or a half if they were sitting at two lambs per lambs week per year. So it is a dynamic thing. Uh, Tom went through the Katahdin New Productivity Index here in the middle. I presented a little differently. It's exactly the same thing. The main focus, number of lambs week. But we consider this index to be appropriate for a maternal breed. Maternal weaning weight, important. Weaning weight, uh, a little less important than a breed like Katahdin, which are out on generally forage based production, limited creek feeding. The milk from that mother is pretty important. They also tend to be weaned early, have higher prolificacy. The milk from that mother does a pretty good job in keeping lambs alive. I also thank Tom for explaining why number of lambs weaned has a big plus, the number of lambs born has a little minus. I'm going to re-emphasize it because it's not intuitive. If I got number of lambs weaned at two, I could easily have number of lambs born at two or three. I'm going to give the lamb to you who has two lambs born and two lambs weaned. A little bit of credit compared to the U that has three lambs for two lambs. I don't want that lamb to die, but I'm going to give a ton more credit to the U that has three lambs born and three lambs weaned. 
she's still the big winner. I put this up here because I think it has implications for Western Ranch production. Why do you like the times? Do you like them because they're moderately sized, fairly low maintenance, fairly easy keeping? Or do you like them in spite of the fact? Would you like them to be big old Columbia looking news? Would that just make you feel better? <laughs> and the implications of that is if the industry out here says we want bigger lands, are you willing to maybe give up a little new productivity to get bigger land? Or at least balance your emphasis more toward bigger lands and less toward really productive, easy keeping years? Is that a trade off you're comfortable with, willing to make, and just hate to do? It's a fair question, I think. I think I know the answer. I think that the cotton's excellence in youth productivity is their strength in addition to their parasite resistance, which may or may not be important to you out here. But that's a choice you get to make and you might be asked to make if you want to really have inroads into the Western Range market. Okay, so before we go on then, if you're going to fit the stereotypical Western Range feedlot market production system, you may need to think about getting more growth in your economic sheep. You may need to think about a little emphasis on muscling. You may need, based on the hands of an app, to think about whether fecal egg count is something you want to need to emphasize. These are questions only you can really answer. But I think some of the comments we've made, some of the things that Brett is hoping to do with the cotton sheep here on the station, and hopefully some of the ideas I've been able to share with you will help you make those decisions. I want to talk a little bit about code before we quit. Uh, try not to take too long. I consider this a pretty uh, typical, a code in the mid-Atlantic stage where I live. It's not a slick Caribbean hair coat, but I don't see any obvious wool, but it's still a thick coat, isn't it? It's a pretty thick kind of a coat. Now contrast, whoops. Oh, and we know that the Katahdin has type definitions for coat, A, B, and C. I'm assuming you're all relatively familiar with those, probably very common. The A code, essentially no unshed woolly fiber. So this girl is probably an A code, I would think. Coat type measured, I think, between April and October. So a ewe that grows some wool in the winter and sheds it off can still be an A code. B and C has a little bit of wool in that. The double A code, which was a, a thing a few years ago, was the ewe that has that wool-free coat all year round. And that, as I understand it, is no longer a thing for the Katahdin Hair Sheep International. People might talk about it, but sheep are not being graded for this double A coat. They still are by the Canadian system. I don't know that I fully understand that, but essentials. I want to compare that now to the true hair sheep from the Caribbean that are the ancestors of the Katahdin. Here's the St. Croix. Uh, these are sheep in Virginia, but they are relatively purebred St. Croix, Virgin Island white hair sheep. Probably the closest thing we have to the hair sheep ancestor of the Katahdin. And you see, uh, there's a little bit of thickness about some of those coats, but in, I think this was a uh, probably an April breeding for fall lambing. Uh, those coats are a little less thick and the ewes are uniformly pretty clean. But these sheep in Virginia are still different from these Caribbean hair sheep in Trinidad in the tropics, where the coats are very clean, very short, stay this way all year round, as you might expect. Uh, this is a coat that one would have to ask if you would like to transplant into 
worth sent on one hand. Not sure about that. I'm also not sure that these sheep couldn't grow some wool if they felt like they needed to. <laughs> I mean, I think many of you have seen goats that will thicken up their hair coat in the winter. Not just cashmere goats, milk goats, wash goats. When it gets cold, they'll thicken up. And I think we'll see some of the same things. Some other examples, these uh, sheep on top are Brazilian Santa Inez. These are now a pretty typical hair sheep, but they were derived as a hair wool cross using the Italian Bergamasco wool sheep. And you see the girl on the left has a little bit of wool down her back, a little bit of wool on her hips, even in tropical Brazil. And she's been in tropical Brazil as a breed a long time. To contrast that, I've got a three quarter St. Croix yearling you in Virginia. And she's three quarter St. Croix, not three quarter cotton. But she's got already that sort of thick hair coat look that I think is fairly typical of the cotton breed. That suggests by the time you get to a seven eighths Katan, you ought to be able to get something that looks quite a bit like this. This is a shot from Sedalia. I know these sheep are clipped, but they actually produced a nicer, I was going to use and emphasize the one in front, but then I realized the pair is a nice example of that sheep in the back that even though it's probably been clipped to clean it up a little bit, has a woolly coat. Or a very thick haircut. Uh, so I think we need to think about what kind of sheep, or if a different sheep is needed in the mid Atlantic states and in the Mountain West. How many of you have most of your sheep with an A coat? How many of you have quite a number, a reasonable number of views with B and C coat? Yeah, wonder which one would be best in a big range flock in the northern Rockies. I don't know the answer to that. I do know that in the early years of the cotton breed, there were a number of breeders in Alberta that were quite happy with their cotton sheep. I don't know much about what they looked like, because that was probably 20 or 25 years ago when I was aware of them, but they were doing pretty well. Uh, now, how do you establish substantial numbers of commercial Katahdin views in a rangeland production system? And do you, what kind of sires do you use to make the market? And what are they going to look like? Now, this is a shot of some St. Croix Sophocles we made at Virginia Tech. These are mostly first generation crosses. I have a feeling this little gal in the middle is a yearling second generation cross. We did have some of those Sophocles that shed clean like she did in the sun. But we had a lot more that looked like the rest of these things. One of the problems I see in using the Katahdin as a commercial rangeland view is how do you start? Because if you start by using Katahdin rams in a pre existing Rambouillet flock, except for the color, you're going to get a ton of this. So some breeders won't be bothered by it, commercial breeders. Some commercial breeders will be bothered by it. Uh, big gobs of wool falling off, falling off in the right places down the front. See the shoe on the side and the, on the back, along the, the underline. So you're probably not going to have to shear, but this is what the cross threads are going to look like. So, how do you get started? I'm not unhappy with the U. Uh, this stuff of Katahdin U, uh, yeah, I'll take that U. I can, I can make some lambs with her. But I've still got this shedding issue. So how do we start? This uh, U is probably a Palate type crossed on a St. Croix with the lamb sired by Sox. 
She's not very, she's still pretty wool, right? She'll drop off a little more of that wool as the summer progresses, but not all of it. Uh, again, is this the way we're going to move forward? Or are we going to move forward by uh, selling or, or breeding straight bred Katahdins for the commercial rangeland industry? And if we want to sell purebred Katahdin new lands, can you make enough to matter? I don't know the answer to that, but I bet it's a challenge. These little guys, by the way, uh, interesting. There's actually, if you start counting feet and look at the direction the hawks go, there's three of them. There's one back there in the back. Uh, we let these ewes raise these three Suffolk sired lands, but we needed 60 days. Uh, most of them lived, but they were kind of ugly because they were hungry. They could literally lift the shoe up off the ground by the time they were about six, eight weeks old. It was just, boom, want to eat. <laughs> So we weaned them and they didn't look too great. And in about four weeks, these guys just erupted. They were pretty good market lands. So you can do it, but, but it takes a little bit of thought. So let's talk about how you might put together a range plot of Katahdin sheep. So let's say we needed, uh, let's say we had a thousand lambings by Katahdin ewes. And that would produce about 750 ewe lambs per year. And it looks like my numbers to do this were really pretty consistent with the numbers we've seen up to now. You're going to need to keep about 30% as replacements in your flock. It's probably your responsibility to cull about the bottom quarter before you offer them for sale as replacement new lambs. But some of them are going to be small and you want to sell good ones. So you're going to have about 225 surplus new lambs for sale if you start with a thousand recorded lambings by Katana ewes. You're culling pretty hard. You're keeping 30% as replacements. You might have about 100 cull ewes that you would be uh, happy to sell to someone that don't have any problems. They just don't belong in a seed stock. So you might be able to shoot out 325 surplus breed views from a baseline of a thousand recorded lambs. And if you were selling those to a commercial breeder, you'd have 325 the first year. Uh, you might add another 325 the second year. And I also assume that he would breed those few lambs to the cottons that had a few on their own flock. So you might be at 700 by the second year. By the third year, 1,100 potential Katahdin replacements. So you could turn that 1,000 new flock into a hair shoe flock or Katahdin flock. So you need to start with about 1,000 recorded lambings. Over three years, you could get a flock of around 1,100 Katahdin breeding ewes. And after that, you're going to need about 250 replacements a year, and that 1,000 recorded lambings could cover that. That's one band of sheep, right? One band of sheep. Now, I'd be curious, I'll just get an idea. Oops, we're about to be finished. How many of you have more than 500 views? How many of you have more than 250? How many of you have more than 100? Left to three. How many of you have more than 50? How many of you have less than 50? How are you going to get these used for the study use? How are we going to do it? And I'm, I'm asking that in a very, I'm asking that as a challenge for y'all, as a challenge for us all to think about. How are you going to move toward a hair sheep based range 
sub industry, something more than a flock or two. How are we going to get that done? And part of the problem with getting that done is those prosperous views I showed you. It may be a little bit difficult to get someone who's got a flock of pretty decent Rambouillet ewes to move to the Rambouillet equivalent of this for a while. It just may be difficult to get that done. I think it's something we have to think about. Now, here's one option. Now, this, this pyramid was designed to look at uh, the impact that you might have for NSIP polypeptides on an industry. So if you can produce a thousand lambings within the elite nucleus box, a little sooner in this room because you're here, Heck, must be. If you can multiply those some way, you can you can keep a you can maintain a ram band if you're thousand lambings or maybe 850 purebred rams. That's assuming you use the rams for about two and a half years each and just replace the ones you got to replace. That would maintain about 43,000 you multiply. But there's no basis for that multiplier flock in the industry that I know about for a hair sheep multiplier. So you got to figure out if there are going to be flocks like those shedding hair wool mixed flocks or whether you can reasonably increase your numbers. If you could do this, you could support a breeding population of about 70,000 commercial ewes. But I don't know how you create the middle. And I say that just to challenge all of us to think about. It. Not that you can't, not that you shouldn't try, but to figure out how you do it, how you really have the impact you want. You know, if you have polypay sheep and you want to convince a Rambouillet breeder to use polypay rams and keep some poly Rambouillet rams back as replacements, well, that's a pretty low cost thing. Yeah, your wool quality goes down a little bit, but they're still white face sheep and still run your wool through the normal wool channels. But to me, this is the challenge. Can you get big enough, fast enough, or develop a strategy that the few commercial range breeds will accept to get those flocks out there in something other than a sort of specimen flock basis? I don't know. I think there's lots of things to think about in terms of doing that. And with that, well done. I'm ready for questions. I'm ready for your ideas. Let me see if I can. I think we're done. Let's make sure. Yeah. And Dora could do the wool sheep slide to do it. <laughs> It's it's a real challenge. Uh, the other thing I think we'll talk about maybe in the discussion a little bit is what are the mechanisms you can use if you wanted to get five bands of Katahdin sheep out there. Is the only way to do it to make crossbred Katahdins, which is not. Want to get the same acceptance as if you could walk a time machine out here, get a bang in your own drums. Okay, questions, comments? Yes. What if the, what if the range flock bought 250 head of you lambs and ran them separately mm -hmm. and bred them back to spread your cotton? Well, I did it. Do this, do this. Yeah. Her, as well as buying, if he bought 250 this year, he buys another 250 next year. Well, I did yeah. actually include that in that calculation. Yeah. Because he was going for three years at least, he was going to devote all of his purchase katadas to making katadin replacements. And then after three years, he was going to default to probably making crossbred replacements. We didn't get to that. We should have gotten that more. Are these going to be purebred cotton green sheep? <coughs> uh, I, I, I think only until it gets us to get a close to the number that he wants to run. I agree. And now I did include him doing that for three years to get his flock. And he would he would be using some of these smaller groups of 
people to supply yeah. him yeah. as well as he can supply himself. Yeah. You see on the bottom line there, uh, he needs two, about 250 replacement years a year to yeah. keep going. And I think that's much more reasonable to be able to buy those from hopefully an expanding base of the top three. I don't think you I don't think he could take it, just throw it in and say, okay, a period of years, I want to have a hair shoot back. He's going to have the best shoot back. It still gets on his back, still has other troubles, doesn't have the characteristics of, of the of the top sheep. Well, that's going to be the question is whether those those uh, hair wool, obvious hair wool crosses are going to fit in well. Now, I think when the lambs go to the feedlot, as I understand pretty typical management, uh, that if you were to take the, the Katahdin type view, cross her on Suffolk Buck, you would get some lambs that are going to have a very clearly mixed hair wool coat. Mm -hmm. But if you sell those lambs into a feedlot, they're going to get sheared probably into the feedlot. And so that's not really going to be an issue. And I think in order to get the lamb weights you're going to need, that you're going to have to probably not be seeing purebred katahdins as the market lamb on the range. I think they're still going to be crossed on Suffolk or something like it, or you're going to have to find a white lamb market. You don't think that he will get a, a, a big enough to prove it in his, his uh, early numbers? To offset the size. I think I'm going to get both. I'm going to get the I'm going to get the number born and weaned from the Kastad mother, and I'm going to bring in something like a Suffolk ram to make that thing fit the feedlot stereotypical feedlot weights. And I'm going to have lambs that have a hair wool coat. If we take them to the feedlot, shear them into the feedlot. I don't think what's going to happen now that he up there that level is good. He's going to have to be all careful. He's going to back, back slide his feet back into the water. No, because he's not going to keep those ewams. You can't keep those ewams. You have to either buy fresh ewams or you have to devote a part of your flock to breeding straight to the top. Maybe, maybe that is. And if they're, you know, as good as, as we hope they are, you have to do that. I mean, you know, rabbit leg guys don't turn into something. <laughs> because they know they have got to have that sheep, but it's a challenge, and you know nothing wrong with the challenge. And you know you may find two or three breeders who are willing to have Suffolk Katahdin or sorry, Bramley Katahdin sheep for a while, just to get in. But a lot of them don't look at those hair wool mixed coats, and you know they're going to get embarrassed by their neighbors. <laughs> It's not going to go. Yes, ma'am. So, so in the beginning, you were talking about the sharing cost and everything. I mean, when you said your cost spreads for the feedlot, for the feedlot, I mean, they're, they're going to have to pay the two shears, and it's going to be junk, and they're going to have to, I mean, what are they going to do with it? I mean, what's the cost? Well, no, they're, they're going to shear those lambs anyway. I don't know what the value is of that lamb's wool in the food lot, right? Well, I don't. I, don't, I think. I think uh, generally they won't. They won't shear. I think they'll take them straight. You know, in the feed lot, they'll grow them straight. Unless I misunderstood the question. If they take those wheat lambs in, they'll take them straight through. And then those those pellets just won't. They'll be they, down they at the bottom. Trip, they won't trip that on a set of ramble lambs. Well, now, now, now the ramble uh, is different. Okay. Um, what about the blackface ramble? Blackface ramble, ramble for the Suffolk sire. Well, still they'll, they'll take they'll take. I mean, they're going to work with those pellets with the with the But they're going, they're not going to share them with the lot. Um, sometimes yes, sometimes no. With no, they will they will share them. They'll share them late winter usually. They usually they need at least sixty days regrowth on the pellets. But I, okay, I was thinking more of the ones we're going to slaughter. So you're, you're gaining in, in weight, I mean, you're losing it on the, the, the sharing end of it too. Well, but where do you share off those speckle face lambs is what they need. I mean, you're talking four, five, six, ten cents a pound. Yeah. So that feedlot wool is 
you know, yeah. it's not worth a lot of money. Yeah. I would think the gain you would get by marketing a separate cotton meat lamp would way overrule the amount of by still having to shear that cotton into the law. Really. I'm not sure that's true, but we'll see if you have So it's a gain you'd like to have if you could do pure vertical cotton. I think you give up so much weight you can't. That's my opinion. Or you start moving the cotton to being a bigger sheet. I've left that door open. I'm not going to either walk through it or slap it. Well, something we see is like my market on my cotton weathers, which mostly the seed stuff produces, but I market on my weathers. Uh, I market them to a guy who. Runs a feed lot and he sells the high end restaurants down in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I get a good price. I just sold my January, February weather for $320 a pound. And it's like, that's a good price for here. Yeah. But, um, and he paid me that same $320 a pound for the ones that were weighing 90 pounds and the ones that were weighing 40. But that's the thing, the Katadis. You won't buy anything that is a Katadis. So. Yeah, you know, that, that's then the, the, the alternative trick, if you can pull it off, is to turn that niche into a market mm -hmm. for more sheep. And that's. Uh, and down our way, that guy is buying hundreds of them. I mean, hundreds of them. Well, he goes know. to Missouri because there's not enough here. That have got that. He wants to know what the rating is on the plan, and and there's 60 day adjusted weights, and, and there are 90 day weights, and, mm -hmm. and uh, he's like nobody, nobody hardly does it, so he has to go to Missouri and buy from some of the mocats down there. <laughs> well, you know, is it is it better to try and develop that market locally? Or to spend the extra time and effort to break into the big range block market. Uh, I don't know. I can't say. It's a big market, obviously. If you can become, you know, in the, in the polypay level at least. But it's a market that you guys are not greatly prepared to get into, just in terms of numbers and, and all that. So you know, this may be a better strategy to stay with. What we might define as a niche, but an expandable niche, you know, a niche that could get big, a niche that could be consistent with the way you wish to produce sheep. And, you know, I think everything should be on the table. And we can pull the words of questions now. How do you want to manage it? Did you have any online? Um, no. Okay. But we're having some difficulty online hearing everybody. So okay. we need to. So, so what we'll do, let's transition just, just to the, the open panel discussion and that will be able to capture and help our people online. And so what I'm gonna ask of everybody in here is as well as speakers, if you have a question, come up here, approach the mic, you can address, so Brad's online, Tom, Tom's online. Dave's right here and so we can, um, you know, we, we can manage that. Give us a minute to set up. You know, you actually start your video and you guys can try to see it. And I'll see if you can find the problem. Oh, I see. Yeah, just loop around. Yeah, just loop around. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Okay, so everybody in the audience, when you have stuff, if you're not like right here, just come on up because yeah. nobody can hear when we get past like a 10 foot radius. So, yeah, we're making the question concise and we can repeat it. Yeah, yes, yeah. we can also repeat the question. So, anyway, like I said, we've got Tom and Brad's online, we got the three of us here. So, online people online or people in person here, um, you know, we can open this up, run it as short or as long as, as there's interest. In, Ask about anything, whether it's talk related to the talks or not. And if our online folks want to turn their cameras on, that's okay now. 
I'd, I'd start by asking you guys a question, maybe to start some conversation. I'm sure there's plenty of it. But we're hosting you in Laramie next summer, right? Yes. And I think as an organization, as I was planning for this talk, I think it would be behoove you as a group to think about what are your main goals? Maybe you have those uh, articulated. Is it, is it to solely create some, some camaraderie and fellowship? Is it networking? Uh, is it to do what was discussed today, to maybe take this to a larger stage, to generate better research information on a pretty new breed where there's a lot of questions to be answered? At least from my standpoint, coming from the wool side, the nutrient requirements, how you manage these to finish. I mean, it, it'd be nice as us as the researchers if you said, here are our goals as an organization, what we want to achieve, what we better want to understand. And that way, in future years, we can continue to tailor our message to, to what you need. But I'm really curious, if, as Dave mentioned, with the numbers that we have in this room, is that even the goal to take this on a larger stage? Is it a realistic goal? The only thing that I will run up, our, our goals are to get the producers together, to educate them. Number one, um, uh, I've got it right here in writing, but uh, um, we also want a co-op for the sale of items because we know that the breeders up here don't get the same price as the breeders down in our southern states get. And uh, that's a great. Just question. do what we can to see that that we make it successful. For the well, you know, I don't know that. From what you've just said, and from what I think I know about the, our own contemporaries at home and other places, I don't know that the product that I see coming out, that's not good color for you. <laughs> I'll be a long way away by it. Uh, I don't know that the product I see as sort of a stereotypical Western feedlot heavy lamb is maybe not the product you guys want to produce. I mean, I hear a lot of more niche-oriented, consumer-oriented, and part of that is because of the size of the plots, but maybe you just want to push harder and harder to the markets you're already engaged in, as opposed to stepping all the way into the classic uh, range feedlot production system. And of course, maybe some of you want to do that, and some of you don't want to do that. I think our biggest market, at least in the southern part of our area, is the ethnic market. Okay. And so they take a lighter land, and, and we, yep. we fit that. But I know Ray's trying to work it getting producers up here in the northern states that are for marking their lands and it seems to be a little bit different. Well, the, the re reason that is is because some of these people up in Montana and Idaho have bigger flocks than they do down south. So we've got more lands to sell, bigger Catan flocks, and they're bigger Catan. Right. So if we go back to what Beth was saying earlier, in our goals, or our purpose, whatever you want to say, we're, we're here to educate, represent, and, and create a cooperative amongst our, all yeah. of our members. Yeah. Maybe instead of thinking of those huge swaps, we, we should be thinking of the people that have a thousand head flocks. Yeah, and maybe people who are are not necessarily uh, public grazing very large flocks. Yeah, and rather the the more the, the more influential or larger farm flock, for lack of a better word, kind of producers. Uh, I mean, those are all options. I don't see anything wrong actually with any of them, but I do see a lot of challenges in entering the true rangeland market from where you are today. And, and you know, maybe I'm missing 
something in terms of being able to use these cross grid views. But I don't think I am. I think you want to be offering a Katahdin view pretty darn quick for a Katahdin based producer. And we've got a lot, we've got a lot of work to do on, on proving what, how the feedlot is supposed to handle the Katahdin, Katahdin chief. And what is the ultimate weight to, to maximize both the producer and the people? Yeah, I mean, we've done, we've done a little bit of thinking and talking about that already. And, you know, it's pretty hard to get beyond 130, 120 with a cross grid. Now, some of you are going to say you can do that and they'll still be lean, but once you pop them open, there's going to be a lot of fat inside if you try and take them to over heavy weights. So, you know, you don't want to give up, you don't want to give up a reputation for a really good quality carcass meat product. You want to hold on to that. No, I think that the, to, to really promote the Katahdin, we need to have what is the most productive uh, weight going into the marketplace. If that, if that, Packer gets that lamb at 130 pounds. We got to make, we got to have uniformity so that that meat, when it hits the counter, all looks the same. Right. We don't want to have little, little lamb chops in there and great pictures like this. Well, and I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I do know how our own breeders Tom feel about it. Cotton breeders is there is not a lot of willingness to crossbreed those cotton meats. And yet, if you want to be in the commodity land market in the West, I think you're going to have to crossbreed those cotton meats to get the carbon. Now, you know, not saying you should or shouldn't want to. Our guys don't want to, but they're marketing an awful lot of lightweight lambs. Uh, that's just a somewhat different production system. And it might be a somewhat different sheet depending on the direction you guys think you need to go. So, so I think with the Katana, the flavor is totally different. That's important. So when you're a larger carcass, but it doesn't taste the same, you know. Yeah, not. yeah not. so so our focus, I think, needs to be educated <coughs> in getting. And I, I don't know that, but I assume most hair sheep don't carry a mutton flavor. That's probably not an unfair comment. You could get well, I, I, don't, I, don't I tend to agree with you. I mean, uh, we've, we've looked enough to know that uh, Dorper, Katahdin, St. Croix, arguably, you know, I'll, I'll, some, I can find someone who will argue with me, but, but that's not a bad assumption. Your problem. Okay. So, so we want we want larger sheep to sell to have more meat. Yes. Good flavor meat because there's a lot of people that don't buy mutton because it tastes like meat. Yeah. You yes. know, and we we need to be pushing maybe so we have more uh, you know a heavier heavier sheep. Yeah. But, but we need to be educating about the flavor and have some people to flavor. So we have overall a better sheep market. People, the public wanting to eat our meat. Well, that's an argument that we that crossbreeding is not the best way to go. I'm not going to take any side on that, but it's an argument for that. But yeah, if you're going to get into the commodity land market, you're going to need to increase your weights quite a lot. And I would argue probably more than is optimal for cotton productivity. It might be necessary for marketability, but probably not optimal for their product. And I, I will challenge, I mean, I, I think we spent some time, Dr. Gifford, Dr. Murphy, looking at flavor profiles that you can quantify from certain compounds, from that spec, some sensory panel stuff. And the truth is, right now, and you can argue anecdotally, I won't argue, but on the research side, there needs to be more research to differentiate that because as much as we love the taste of our land, I have not seen great evidence to suggest that 
the fatty acids are different, the compounds are different. So I mean, that's not to say there is it, but I think that goes back to maybe something that is a group you can help sponsor. Get to the bottom whether there is a flavor. It's help fund a flavor study or for a graduate student to get at that. That's going to be your marketing niche saying, hey, we like these 50 pound purposes. We think they taste better. Let's quantify. Let's get to the bottom. Or have bigger purposes that still have a flavor. I'd like to see in the meat market you go in and you can buy butter or you can buy guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Is it any different if you like a product? Is it any different than 25 years ago when we had the beef counter and people started advertising the Angus beef? Yeah. We've been talking about that a lot for kids inside the whole We want to be the Angus sheep or somehow brand. We don't have much of a cohesive effort to get and drive something I, back that plane. I actually think you might be. More easily distinguished from sheep meat than Angus beef is distinguished from beef. Yeah. 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 But I think, because I there's a lot, I mean, Angus beef is a lot about the way it's produced and the color of its hide, whatever the genetics. Should it be advertised as air sheep or should it be advertised as the top? First of all, I think we have a broader. Section if we said hair sheep or some other name that that referred to the hair hair right. line. And do we know that all hair sheep taste like mud? That's all. But I, I think yeah, I, I agree with or disagree that, that if it's not not the top, it tastes like mud. That that's a pretty dangerous. <laughs> <thing>. <laughs> I mean, I mean, just for the world that we operate in, we design experiments scientifically try to distinguish. There's there's not much there except imagination at this point. However, I'm not saying there could be, but I think what's important is look at Capra Lamb, right? They're buying a lot of hair buyers up in our country. You guys heard Capra? I'm sure their buyers have tried to get them from there, right? That's a dormer based program. And what's been interesting is we did a field day uh, four weeks ago in Wyoming, and their buyer came up there. And he's running into the same problem we're talking about. He says, well, you know, until we get enough supply, if it's half, half dorper, half wool, well, that's fine. Right. So um, how do you know it's not a half katahdin half? Well, we don't know that, but we don't have the supply to get any kind of chains under our canopy until we have critical mass. So that's not to disparage hair sheep or the group, but I think we should use the baby instead of my <laughs> Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or, or you should just quantify where the difference is in reality, and then move from there. Education. Like research. Education. Yeah. Education. Mm -hmm. Dave, I got a question. Yeah. Um, you you were talking about bringing in and crossing on the white dorper. Did you guys cross the tons on the white dorper, or, or was it just the the composites? Or part of the composite. I, I think you're thinking of Graham. I might be. We have a, we, we've had a few doors. He might I still be on. I, I think you're thinking of Graham. Yeah, maybe ask Brad. Yeah. Well, He's still on. Could, you, could you repeat the question? I caught a little bit of it, but. When you guys, did you cross Katahdin's and White Dorbers? So, yes, the, the, the. Did you do that lesson? Uh, so the, use or no, let me back up on that. The, the composite itself was created by mating Katahdin rams to Romanoff use and white Dorper rams to Romanoff use, and then taking males from both of those crosses and mating to females of both of those crosses in a reciprocal manner to create the composite. So there was not a single crossbred Katahdin Dorper okay. in that experiment. About that because it seems like you get a lot of people who are crossing Katahdins and Dorpers, but they're using Dorper U's, which have lower productivity with Katahdin Rams. And it's like, it should be switched around and use those higher productivity Katahdin U's and a Dorper Ram. But 
Yeah, I mean, it intrigues me, and you know, while I'm getting myself in trouble, I'll just go on. That <laughs> absorber <laughs> is kind of trying to be a sire breed, but a little tiny sire breed, and I don't understand that. I mean, I really think that that outside the arid areas of Texas where the dwarf breed is really quite well adapted, that a bigger dwarf could, could do a lot of good things for the hair symptoms by being a true sire breed. And I don't think they are now. They, they kind of have the shape, but they don't have the performance, I don't think. Like I said, I'm not sure. so, so Dave, one of the interesting things that came out of multiple evaluations that Craig had initiated was in that, in that, uh, you know, you've read, you've reviewed the papers for us, but in that, uh, experiment, we tried five different kinds of Romanoff crosses from a maternal performance perspective, how different the white dorper and the quote black face dorper crosses complemented the Romanoff. But that difference was about as big as any other breed type cross that we tried. Yeah, I do remember that. I, I don't know that I ever understood it. Fully. So, so my only, my only recourse in trying to explain that in the paper was the fact that even though the white faced dorper and the black faced dorper have one common breed association, if you read back in the literature of how those different breeds were actually formed in South Africa. There was, there was some different genetics that contributed. It wasn't just a white Persian with the, the pole dorset as it was with the black Persian and the pole dorset for the black dorper. There was, there was other germplasm involved, like, for instance, the Van Roy. Right. And, and it's my, my opinion that, that that contribution somehow is playing a role in the white dorper genetics and how well that did on a maternal side. Now, I'm not commenting on, you're right, I think it's a wrong thing for the dorper to be pushing itself so much as a terminal sire. Yeah, I mean, if we could use a terminal sire hair sheath, I just don't know where the right place is to get one. I don't think it's the katata because I think you give up too much trying to play that game. The dorper muscling might make it the better, better candidate and you know, we don't have to have just one kind of door for you. Individual breeders can go in different directions. So I think a larger frame dorper would have a role to play in the industry. It isn't being played right now. Just so one thing that I wanted to bring up, which I do not have scientific backing for, but just in my experience, the stronger the wool trait is in the cross the longer it takes to breed it out. So for example, if I breed a katad into a rambolet, it takes three years-ish from my experience. Whereas when I cross with a Suffolk, I can cross it out within the first generation. And so I think that has to play some sort of level too, because if you're trying to get away from the wool, but you're trying to bring in some of that range component, you're gonna end up still shearing sheep for generations to come. And I, I don't know how much influence that has, but it's certainly something to consider. I know, that's why I kind of used a different, said we, we've got a different strategy. If we want to replace a Rambouillet flock with a Katahdin flock, we probably need to do that as a replacement, not as a breeding exercise. Right. I mean, none, none of what you said would surprise me. And even, and even our suffix, it's going to take two to three generations to get where we want to be. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting, those Suffolk's, we, we bought the Suffolk Rams from the Eastern Island for a purpose. Their wool began about here. So these were a pretty bare, they were a very bare set of Suffolk's. And still, you know, we had a few that shed clean. And we, were, we thought that was cool, but not particularly useful. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So the question for you is on the kind of broader philosophical level. You're talking about selecting for different traits for range operation with big leg count and hair set resistance. There's been some at least evidence to suggest, not necessarily anything conclusive, but that hair set resistance is related to overall immune system function. 
Do you think there's a, a role in keeping some levels of parasite resistance or at least keeping from selecting some uh, positive big blank health values to keep that? Or do you think that that trade is going to be so minimally effective that it's not that easy to sort of explain? Uh, I think if you, I think the, probably the safest answer is to periodically sample land from areas that are focusing or at least considering feed the weight count. I actually think that as long as you didn't actively select against it or with traits that might reduce parasite resistance, you probably have enough in the Katahdin to hold you for quite a long time. Now, you know, you're probably, if you decide to move away from a lot of emphasis on fecal egg count, you probably aren't going to sell any lambs into Georgia. But maybe that's not what you aspire to do. But I think you have to be, I guess I would worry if you were selecting really hard for large, high growth Katahdins, that you might lose some of that fecal egg count and have to somehow regain it or lose your market to sell rams into the southeast. I don't know if you covet that market or have that market or can you. I suspect it's not a big deal. But I think the Katahdin's got quite a bit of resilience and is going to hold a pretty good level of parasite resistance for quite a while. Now, did, are, there, are there comments, those of you on irrigated pasture, Pam, or can make about this issue? I mean, do you have, do you have problems with Parasites on your irrigated pasture? I think you manage management the main solution. And it's a, and you're happy you can manage it. Yeah. Uh, fine, you don't, you can manage it away. You don't have a great need to, to breed for more, for certain. It's kind of nice to have that baseline of resistance to the Katan. Just makes the management easier. There's a controlling issue. The rest of you agree there were at least three or four hands up? Yeah. 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 Um, so I have been through the big lake house the last few years on the gate pasture. Uh, and I'm running a pretty high stocking density just because almost all my ground is leased pasture. Mm -hmm. And so I have seen some larger challenges and compared with Grand in the south and uh, mm -hmm. southeast and it's pretty comparable. And so I think what like Gary was saying, a lot of it's just management, how many views you're putting right or how fast you're looking at that. Those of you who are very passionate, they just periodically need to buy some replacement rams from the southeast that, that have that trait at a pretty high level. And you know, it probably doesn't disconnect you from the breeding programs of the others in the, in the room at all. We're, we're, we're talking about the regional differences. Pardon? We're, 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 we're talking about the regional differences of prejudice against the air. Uh -huh. We're from South Central Montana. Okay. And our county had the most wool shipped in the entire world. Okay. So we are, and, and Lonnie's family in line with the last big thing in the Okay. And we both bought in the ocean. And they're about to probably burn across on our lawn. You know, it's, it's different here than it is in, you know, Virginia, mm. than it is in New England. I think we all have different challenges in our markets. So where where is we you know we ship thousands of lands out. You know, right now my new market is registered buyers. Mm -hmm. And so 575 is things on the carrying on the average Yep. Yeah, I mean you can't go halfway. You can't you can't have a mixture of the two. I think you either go all the way in or all the way out. And, and you know, I think some of the things we've talked about today about how to take advantage of what markets there are, but if you get big, that becomes a bigger challenge. And then, you know, maybe you could organize into coping with that challenge, but it's going to become a bigger challenge, I think, to do it by yourself. Yeah, we, we've had real prejudice from the auction yards in Billings against our sheep. Yeah. But last last fall, um, my, my red lambs split on myself. So, you know, they're beginning to come around, yep. and, and Lonnie's got a big bunch that she might have to sell, mm -hmm. and now they're interested in her. So it's, it's slow, but it's beginning, and you're not Yeah. Yeah. But anyway. Well, you know, I mean, if you find the, you find the kind of big range producers who just love to do things nobody else does because they like to tweak people, 
Well, you know, so long as you're cheap, don't hesitate. <laughs> but the idea that you're going to be able to supply a big chunk of the market may be tough. It will be tough, but it doesn't mean it's not doable. I think there's, there's new markets for small amounts of sheep developing very quickly. We have people that, that uh, run a lot of cattle that are looking at bringing in some sheep to run behind those cattle on different people, on different grounds mm -hmm. and whatnot, on supplying blood and that kind of thing. And they're asking for more. Yeah. And, and of course, if they're asking for more, the neighbors is going to call pretty soon. So there's that, there's a market there. There's going to be a market, I think, on some of this government money to get some sheep back on it to start cleaning the vegetation We have we have Dealt that yet, but if there is, the, the hair sheep folks had a very, a very good chance of being able to grow on that. Well, I mean, the public land is a different thing, but for us in the east, I mean, those are almost the only markets that are left. Yeah. Those smaller niche markets, but the problems are, are pretty welcome. Now, you know, it's it's not the industry, it's not the American lamb industry, but it's a good profitable market for the people who take advantage of it. If, if we can, along with that, grow to that area, not to get the big budgets and whatnot, if we can just get a fair shake on, on the packers, that would be the big thing. Yeah. And I don't like yeah. the idea that, that you, you can take 10% less because you're getting way more triples. No. <laughs> I'm in the, in the game that when you go to the, like Patty said, when you go to the sale bar, you want to walk away as you were the number, you, you had the number one sheep there. Not because you had a lot more twins and triplets, you had a higher percentage of weaning plants, so you still made more. It's, uh, there's a lot of tradition to get around, and sometimes it's better to just there's also a lot of people who know nothing about those traditions in your markets. And you know, maybe you're better off to try and find those folks, uh, find the, the more niche markets, and, and just see, or, or, or you know, if you can find somebody who wants to be a little bit of a maverick and have a bunch of hands in three bands, well, more power to you. But I don't know that you really yet have the capacity to serve 10, 12, 15 bands Sheep. Uh, I mean, it's not, that's not, not really, state of business. yeah, that's not a judgmental statement at all. It's just, I don't think you're there yet. So, a question along those lines, just from a kind of general producer uh, you know, perspective or attitude, I guess, in the industry and region. If there is one of those you know, producers that's willing to kind of think outside the box and just try it out. Would they generally be open to working with the association level to try to find a group, or are they going to want to find an individual producer? Because from an association level, you know, we could probably put together you know, a few trailers here, a few trailers there, and compile larger numbers, but then they're coming to different management systems, potentially different planning times. Is that something that you think some producers would be interested in as a possible way to get a group of 500 new lands into a block um, to kind of start that process? Really? Co-mingling a lot of sheep and a lot of producers is likely to create health concerns. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you do the best you can. I'd still be probably get reluctant when you got beyond three, four, five producers as sources, just because it's hard to keep the quality control you need, uh, no matter how hard you try. You know, it's not an indictment of how hard you try. It's just hard to do. So, you know, you might get a group, you know, you might try and get 500 or 1,000 years under control of half a dozen people. But I don't know. I wouldn't think long and hard before I let somebody else come in and build a bunch of replacement groups. They'd all have to have your same goals and production and ideas program. and all that stuff. Yeah. The goals of the buyer. Yeah. But I, you know, I, I think one thing, but to relate to that, and you know, looking at opportunity to expand the inventory to get the higher volume because, you know, a lot of it, just like 
just like, I mean, Bad Bad, you mentioned your niche market and that group specifically wanting that sheep, your sheep, or those type. And, uh, but I mean, you go out and shop for that, go out and develop for that. But I mean, I think, depending on what you're mentioning, it is, it's, it's not unheard of to find a group of large wool producers um, that are interested in taking the job. I mean, how do you think the polypay sheep industry is going? How do you think the polypay breed is going? That was against the grain. In fact, where do you see the polypays were developed for this region specifically? That was the focus that uh, Dr. Hewlett and them went. But still, we talk about the bias, and then we have a great example. I mean, from the people up around Billings and whatnot, where do you see the polypay? You see very few polypay sheep in the West. In the upper mountain west, you see them on the west coast, you see them in the midwest, you see them back east. And uh, but my, my point is really there is, is that I don't know, Dave may disagree with me, but I it, is there another composite breed that's been developed in the United States has exploded as quick as the pie, as fast and rapid germplasm applied to producers and grew so quick. Certainly no one's been any quicker. But see, the, the, the reason is, is that when we talk about these composite breeds that may be developed, like at the station or these other places, it's from a small flock and trying to grow that germplasm out can be difficult. But, like I said, back when the polyphase were coming around, I mean, you're talking about, you know, of, course, of course, Dr. Cuba did have a brother that's a sheep producer in the area, Reed. But there were other producers that Reed got together, a bunch of Rambolais, some groups, so they had thousands ready to move in that particular direction. And they did it quick. I mean, the first germplasm released was four years after the first composite was completed. And the association was produced five years after the first composite was. And so my point is, is they did, but they, you know, it was still, I think Reed had to do, the brother had to do the legwork to go out and find those producers. That we're willing to make that leap, just like just like finding your niche market for your product, for your meat, for your whatever, and it was just really individuals coming together and just set the goal. That that's that's what we're going to do, and uh, yeah, because I mean we all know that none of that. And you you know we talked about you know you guys talked about a brand new product and, and you know in the stores. I mean it's one of those deals you almost have to go out and focus on those particular. Uh, meat selling options or change, grocery change or whatever that will specifically partner with you to do that. I mean, the, you know, the, the sheep industry as a whole, I mean, American Sheep Industry Association fights for the case space that Walmart or Albertsons will say, okay, we'll keep lamb in the case. And they go out and advocate and market for that. And it's a battle to fight because some of the, some of the big change are just like, we would just prefer not to carry that because it's only that 18 inch sliver in that case, you can go to Costco around by Costco, but you can go to Sam's here in Idaho Falls, and you've got 18 inches devoted that they'll always have land there. And that's where your big mega association is going to fight that they maintain that slot. And so, so and, and then obviously that slot is going to be dominated by the largest producers or, or the main type of land that's going in there. And if you notice, that little 18 inch slot is filled for a lot of New Zealand land too, when American land is not available. And that's part of that marketing strategy to try to keep some land in that particular case. So I think again on those specialized products, man, you know, you really have to go out and find those groups. And probably the big major chains may not be the ones, but natural grocery or you know, some of the, you know, those may be the ones who say, yes, we would partner with that breed to specialize that particular brand of product. And then almost get into the what we was talking about. Or, the buyer with regard to the Dorper, I mean, they got obviously they got something going, and now they're just not asking for anything to build. Yeah, but I think the last six months, the whole thing has changed. You mentioned like billings this year, we got into the late fall markets, and holy smoke, that 10 15 cent discount disappeared. And our supplies are so low. I think this is the other thing to think about is we're in new waters. I think, yeah, when was the last time we had current cold storage where we didn't have. Eight million pounds of shade. <laughs> I think the, uh, you turn the corner in the land is this hour. I think we're going to have to reshape our paradigm. The old talking points of two years ago, I think they've changed. I don't see us losing that market share once the cruise ships open back up. Now the consumers have had exposure to it at the grocery store. 
And so I think that bodes well for all of us, but if supplies continue to be this low, you could probably just market your lands as commodity lands, and you're not going to see a discount for a long time. I, think. I mean, if we catch up in our supply and all of a sudden we get all the supply stacking up for the cold storage, and nobody wants to eat our product anymore, then it's a different story. But I think what the pandemic did to our demand creation, we have been trying to do for 60 years. And we could, you know. So that's, I just want to throw something out. I'm not a panelist, but. I talk to all you guys, I talk to people all over. We have these small flock groups that are starting to become more primarily in your world, right? This Hershey thing. And there's no consistency, there's no place to market, there's no. So at the end of the day, the question is do we want to become range people or do we want to really capitalize on this niche marketing? And what I hear from you guys every time I talk to you is there's not a shortage of buyers, there's a shortage of a place to take the animals to get them. To yeah. process right mm -hmm. so you guys as an association have an opportunity to find that person in the pacific northeast or the west or wherever it may be that's the most convenient that you can do some halal processing and some restaurant specific cuts and some things where you're getting really niche where the range guys don't want to do that nobody wants to market three thousand sheep in a niche market but 100 sheep it's doable right so that's what I hear when I hear you guys talk. And that's, I mean, I'm also in your same realm when I work in my sheep. It'd be great to have a place that I could just be like, can you process these? I have a hundred buyers, but I have nowhere to take them. Yeah. Um, and, and, that, and Linda, I just kind of jump up on top of what Linda says and combine it with pork wit. And this is, this is where I think that as you guys as association, and then going into the Todd Nanning International Association, and then even going higher to the American Sheep Association. There are opportunities that I don't, that post pandemic, that I don't think if they're not seized will simply disappear. And what I'm talking about, uh, I, I did, uh, I don't know, what did I involve you in that? I just this with ASI trying to find, no, I think it was executive state director. So during the pandemic, when everything was coming to a halt, the hamburger was going for nine bucks a pound at Walmart. And we ate chicken instead. But um, the um, <laughs> it's just in that terrible. But that's because there's a limit to how much I'll pay for eighty five percent lean ground cow. But um, <laughs> but but my, my point is is that so I was calling around a lot of the executive directors, sheep associations in different states, because although we did see a slowing, obviously in slaughter and sheep and the plants, and, the, and of course then you had just the confusion of the whole mountain states states issue that. Was timed in the same deal with the pandemic, but what we what, what you what you saw at least in small ruminant industry is you know there wasn't millions of gallons of commodity milk being poured out on the ground. There wasn't carcasses of lamb like there was in poultry and swine being buried. Okay, what was interesting to see is is that anecdotally at least the data I was able to gather is that that a lot of sheep producers sold locally that even the big guys that normally don't sell locally because it was still an animal and there was still at least some knowledge you can look up bearded butchers on youtube and get instructions how to you know slaughter these animals and we actually did see that in the pandemic nationwide now, like i said that's anecdotal data that i've asked the executive directors poll their producers how many of you guys increased your local sales and the data that came back was quite a bit so my point is is that this is one of the times where you as the agriculture producer didn't have to step out and teach the community how to consume, prepare, and use your product. The pandemic made a lot of people rediscover that. What we used to do and our parents used to do 40, 50, 60, 80, 100 years ago to relearn that. And so I think this is where, I mean, you obviously want to do it on the individual producer level, but I think this is where as associations get together and maybe put that as a goal on your agenda. Let's stay active in that. Let's remind those people that may have bought one or two lambs from me. Let's keep, and they were satisfied with it. They were happy with that. Let's keep that sense uh, alive because I think, again, and you know, there are, you know, we're going to see what President Biden's going to do over the next two or three years in terms of USDA and what Secretary Bill said. But there are, I mean, obviously our food security infrastructure in the nation was threatened during the pandemic. There were issues. Things came to a halt when it shouldn't. And so I think on the federal level, the USDA is just looking at, you know, we'll just see what pans out. I don't know what's going to pan out, but there is consideration on how do we reinvigorate 
local processing of anything, all types of foods. How do we make that stuff locally available when the large processors, whether we're talking about vegetables, whether we're talking about, it doesn't matter. When the large processors come to a halt, how do we keep that active and how do we keep that alive when we don't have so much food waste that we have to dispose of? And so those are, I think, as association group, as your regional association, as you go up to visit with your national association, and then even higher than that, is that's something I'm just asking you to consider to keep that topic alive, because that's what you can do as groups to say, how do we address this? How do we plug into this and, and keep that keep that going? Um, you know, so hopefully what Melinda's talking about, maybe there'll be funding available, the incentives for people to open up the mom and pop slaughter joints in the little towns like it used to be well, just it was just 30 years ago when you could still go see these small towns you know and, and how much of uh uh you know like what we was talking about as far as you know pandemic deal how much can be gained with that so just i just encourage you to keep that alive as a topic when you guys are visiting with each other and when you go to your higher association meetings to maybe make that association priority to keep investigating that staying active in that and trying to move that forward on a national as well as a local level. Yeah. I think I read a little bit being an identity crisis going so fast. You know, that last strategic direction right now, just like work is trying to flush that out. And I know they did a little bit on the CAC Plus program of how mm -hmm. maybe grow in commercial spaces. And then there's been some talk recently about wait a minute, we have 1,500 members and only 500 of them are registering sheep. So, what are the two thirds of our membership? Doing, they're not producing seed stock, right? Now, those people are doing something and they want to be members of the organization. So it kind of seems like a common thread of this local meat thread, right? Like, where, you know, all these people that are like 20 to 200 that are serving this local market and being very successful. And is that really our identity? We've got to get our hearts around what we are, our kind of claim to fame. Maybe right. to our detriment, almost, I feel like our unofficial byline has been like, it's a versatile breed that will work for you, whatever you're doing, but then that's like no identity. Something for everyone, but somehow we have to take up that messaging. Oh, very well said. I mean, yeah, those are the topics that use a group regionally and then carry that up because there could be, there could be, and then there is just like, I mean, when you look at ASI American Spinetry as a whole, you can see the different segmented goals, but it, but at least a lot of those goals are very coordinated and they can address multiple goals because they have, they have multiple deals. But the same thing for the Katahdin groups, both regionally and nationally. Is making sure they actually doing exactly what you're saying. Locally, get it together. What are our agenda items that we want to move up to try to bring bring some some identity? <laughs> you know, yeah, I think it's kind of every man for himself. We don't have much cohesive effort of common goals, or like you had mentioned, some great NSIP Rams or you know, boxes in the system because we're not collaborating to say let's buy that ram and get it circulated. Yeah. That basically would probably be enough to block the deal. Actually, it's the efforts and it's about to happen. Well, and I hate to say it, but particularly in your ethnic side of things, you guys align well with the goat industry, which everybody doesn't no. want to be, but <laughs> frankly, there is no outlet. If, if you could pull in those goat folks, they have no outlet except to go to the local sale barn and hope that somebody spends money on the goat they're selling, right? Like, like bringing that all together, you have similar sized animals, similar buyers, and that to me also could be part of keeping that niche identity as well. A lot of people probably are cringing right now, but there's a lot of similarity there in some of those ethnic market models. So, it's a very emergent non market, right? It's something totally different than what's been happening in the last 80 years. And there's some really fun, cool recipes and things that you can be promoting in your industry that are of those ethnic varieties that are. I mean, we're in, a, we're in a day and age now where, like Brett said, everybody got back to basics, learned how to cook for themselves again. But we also have a generation of people that really want fun, new, different things, and they're trying all kinds of stuff. And I mean, some of those, some of those things that you can eat are so delicious, and people want to try it now. So that's part of the promotion. You know, here's how to prepare this. Here's how to make a really good dish at home. But you don't have to go pay, you know, the Indian restaurant or whatever to do. Good, easy recipe. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> so, other comments or questions? There's a, there's a question, kind of coming to uh, Dr. Nader's question on kind of building areas you know, uh, in the database, NSIP, 
a couple of questions I've been thinking of is, um, you know, if, if we as a, an association are trying to make change, something that I've had several customers come to me and ask is, what am I doing to try to keep use, you know, when they're eight, nine, or 10? Mm. You know, is there, you know, what can we do to have a longevity index? So that we have these ewes that are in production for a long time, so we're not being as inefficient with the sheep that we have. And another one that they've been bugging me on is what are you doing to, you know, breed and select sheep that are putting out lower levels of methane and other things? What, what would be required you know, at us as producers to try to come up to put this and, and have an index with you know, some sort of metric? That could be, you know, quantified. That right. could be selected for, you know, that, that could really put us out front, you know, for these these customers who are really looking for something that's more natural and, you know, is good for the environment, and making a positive change. Well, you have to feed them corn. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was just trying to say. You know, if you, if, well, it's, they, I know they've done some tests and, and they know that it's possible, and I know they've done some stuff with. Uh, like, uh, I'm trying to think of what it is. Uh, anyway, there's a certain seafood. There's a certain seaweed, yeah. Yeah, seaweed, yeah. yeah. If they've been there's feeding seaweed. it in, it lowers it down to 30%. Or yeah. I know there's some of those things, but that's something that I've got a lot of customers asking me about. And I, I'm sure there's a way to to take, do some sort of a test, you know, maybe maybe something similar to fecal egg count that could be done that could, could give us some data. I suspect a lot of this. Uh, oh yes, it is. But but there are some that are lower, and that's they're wanting to try. They're wanting me to select ones that are lower. So so there is an active genetics discovery phase research effort going on right now in New Zealand, where they're you know within their organizational structure. They've created equipment to go around to individual flocks and on a daily basis, they will stick these animals. And I can't remember the numbers now and Tom may have more specifics on this to remember than I do, but they'll actually measure individual animals over a, say a 12, 14 hour time period for methane emissions. And they're measuring that data with the intent of incorporating that into genomic selection programs down the road, knowing that their New Zealand system is going to be hit with how do they deal with carbon emissions? They're, they're, they're pursuing that route now. It's, it's expensive. That equipment and hauling it around and collecting that data is very expensive, but it is possible and there are options out there doing that now. Todd and Breed is probably positioned as well to get involved with the genomic technology that goes with that as any group. And one thing to mention on that, and this is where we as researchers, both ARS and the land grant systems with Linda here, is this is where, I mean, kind of what you just mentioned is where we ask for your help. And you know that that comes from the level of your activity with your state as well as your national legislatures getting in there, telling them the need for that research. Because two of the geneticists that are online right here, you know, we longevity, you know, is is in their top priority, and they've got one of the largest Katahdin blocks in the nation, and works. They're expanding that here to get the environmental effects, and so so um, you know our component. Um, and uh, their initiative is, is looking at all the factors that's going to drive longevity. How do we keep, because obviously it doesn't matter what, what domestic animal you're raising for food, the longer that animal can stay in the system reproductively, the more efficient you are because you're not having to drive so many replacements in the system. And, uh, and then also on our side with the rangeland component, our initiatives that we're moving into is, is, is the balance in terms of carbon sequestration. In terms of, of reducing fuel loads, but you know what 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 ecological value do grazing sheep add back? Because it's you know as the world looks at it, the world looks at it anything that's human involved, which domestics would be a product of human involvement. 
you know, is you know, the dog knows it's got to be bad for the environment. Well, it's like looking at those trade offs with when you're sheep grazing, when you're talking about invasive weeds, when you're talking about increasing fuel load, decreasing fire threat, well, all of those things. Those are things that we're all moving into right now as a full research program. This is, so your comment is dead on. And this is where you help us out in making sure that you're involved in listening sessions that we do. You're involved with your legislators and saying this is important research. And the research, whatever we solve with regard to sheep in terms of, of portrait methane emissions, carbon sequestration, all of those things, those things can be further multiplied to other grazing species. I mean, it may not be species specific, but like on the grazing deal and carbon sequestration, I mean, we can totally demonstrate that, you know, this can be done with other. And so when you're talking to the legislators, say, this is just not a very selfish deal. I mean, obviously I'm a sheep producer and I'm advocating for more sheep research, but the, the, the data that, if this is funded, the data that results from this goes international. It helps solve world problems. It helps solve other grazing species problems and things like that. And then that's also how you multiply that because, you know, a legislator may be saying, well, you're just being very small focused on, you know, a low number of them, you know, animal food animals in the United States. It's like, well, no, this goes beyond that. We solve these problems here that can be used model for the major, major species. So, so well said, I appreciate the comment, but you know, that's reciprocal of what we ask back to you is that you don't forget we are research organizations and we depend upon taxpayer funding and how that's allocated to us to return to that research. Well, and, and the sheep industry is not particularly innovative. And therefore, a subset of the sheep industry that went to people who were innovative and said, we'd be interested in getting involved in this, which I'm pretty sure the American sheep industry isn't going to say, might get a pretty nice response as, you know, we need to prototype some things somewhere else. Let's talk. I mean, that's one thing the Biden administration is, is, is keen on and also keen on funding the discoveries of those things that directly impact our environment. And so we as researchers, if we can plug into that, but that's based upon your efforts you know, with Congress and through your associations. I mean, just like they said, I mean, sometimes your association is not going to align, the National Association is not going to align regionally with what y'all think is priority. Well, that's fine. Okay, y'all are on your own. You're going to go out and get that. But at the same time, don't turn your back completely to because they're going to have initiatives that you do align. You know, it's just like all of you guys. I mean, talking about your marketing. I mean, this region of the country is focused specifically on parasite resistant with all crops. Whereas, well, y'all are looking at different markets and different issues. So you align on some issues, but other issues as a smaller group, you may have to go out to your own. It's kind of absurd that is there any um, research being done on resistance to Yoni's disease? Brad, um, did you hear that? Or Tom, Tom, did you hear that? Are they still on? I, I was muted for a second. Sorry, I was talking and I realized that you couldn't hear me. <laughs> My wife wishes she had the mute button sometimes too, I'm sure. <laughs> but yeah, there there is Yoni's research going on. And in particular, one that I'm specifically aware of is, is not domestically, but they've, they've uncovered a potential variant that might be associated with the yonis in Dorper populations. And that's being done overseas in Turkey, although my colleague Mike Keaton has connections to it as well. So there, there was some initial steps by us and, and colleagues at Texas A&M also that, to try to take an initial look at some of those and they haven't gotten very far yet. So it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of uh, not just few cases, it takes, takes a lot of data to get, get at some of those genomic questions. So it, it all depends on if the industry says, look, let's deal with yonis, it's a big problem. And, I, and it's not been my sense that that has reached that level as, as say OPP did in the past. 
think probably the two organisms that the ARR agency is most focused on, um, you know, with uh, Brad, Brad just mentioned OPP, but uh, um, micro, mycoplasma open pneumonia, which is the whole big one. So there's an enormous amount of funding that's, that's centered on that particular organism as well. But again, just like Brad said, I mean, not domestically, but those are one of those things that the sheep industry as a whole, if that's something, I mean, that's, that has to go up through a pretty coordinated lobbying direct effort to, to direct an agency to look at that, or if it's a state to direct a land grant universe to look at that. But like I said, that's where the legislatures come in to, to allocate that funding for that. But that was a good question. Thank you, Brad. Other questions? Well, okay. Um, Brad, Tom, and, and the last few remaining web attendees, thank you guys very much. And uh, I appreciate your patience. This last session may have been a little bit difficult to hear, but thank you for hand, uh, hanging in there. And uh, so Brad and Tom will let you guys go again. Thank you, thank you, thank you for agreeing to, um, to, to speak and visit with the audience here. Absolutely. No problem. Thank you. Been a, been a pleasure. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.